Tonight's episode of the Tuesday Night Cigar Club is brought to you by Drew Estate. Come experience the rebirth of cigars at www.drewestate.com and download the free Drew Diplomat smartphone app today to discover nearby retailers, RSVP to special events, redeem points to win exclusive Drew Estate merchandise, and much, much more. Vampires versus werewolves. Whataburger versus In and Out Burger. Taylor Swift versus Katy Perry. Which I just heard three people got shot last night due to that beef, so don't fuck with those bitches. Jerry Jones versus Sound Draft Picks. Cats versus Dogs. And last, certainly but not least, Roma Craft Tobacco versus Viaje Cigar Company. That's right, <laughs> folks. We're going to talk a little bit about beef tonight. We're going to talk about craft. What's beef, Kate? And what that, what is beef? Uh, and what that term craft truly means anymore in a world overflowing with artisanal penis pumps and small batch erection creams. I heard about them from a friend. Uh, we're going to talk about cigars, about beer, hopefully about a movie, uh, but you never know how things will unravel when we find ourselves here at Roma Craft headquarters. Uh, so let's just get things started, shall we? Uh, I want to thank Mike Rosales and Skip Martin for inviting us. It is the Tuesday Night Cigar Club, episode 73. Thank you, boys. Welcome. Always, you. always a pleasure to sit down with you. Weren't we like episode eleven, twenty six? You know, you guys were in our first year out at TJ's Cigar Lounge. You invited yeah. us out there uh, before this place was a blip on the map, and then uh, we were here. Was it early last year um, for Heat? Uh, we did a, a, a big event here for that, so it's been a while. M- most of that is in is in the archives, though. I think it, it's been lost to the archives. <laughs> yes, Cody, did you ever build those archives? I did. Where are they? I don't know. Okay. We'll find them one of these days. Uh, werewolf or vampire, Skip? Choose. Which one? If you had to be one. Uh, vampire. How come? Uh, well, there's all the hot chicks, number one. Um, there's no Michael J. Fox involved in that. True. Legacy. True. Um, they live forever. And they only have to basically avoid sunlight, garlic, and Silver. wood steaks to the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, uh, what about you, Mike? No, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I think you have to go vampire. I mean, you don't smell like a dog, right? And you're, sure. you don't rip your clothes up every time you, you don't trans- have, yeah, fleas transform. And, fleas yeah. and ticks aren't a problem. Right. So, um, and it, you know, I wouldn't have to lick my balls all the time. So, True. I mean. But you could if you wanted you, to. You could. Yeah, I spent a lot of time doing nothing, I guess, at that point. I'd go werewolf. <laughs> I'm in a minority. I always thought it'd be cool because you get more flexibility with your wardrobe. Fuck that cape noise. Uh, that's kind of. Weird. I'd, I'd get it like a, a don't belt. Don't you want a castle, though? I mean, you know, most vampires yeah, have like a cool Plus, you're only a werewolf like certain times, like yeah, once a month. Or you right. could wear a belt and hang like jean pockets off of the belt, so you could carry around. Once again, you're wrong, Cade. Yeah. 
once again. You could have one of those janitor key things that stretches out. That way, if you don't kill any joggers that night and you're hungry, you got your wallet and your back jean pocket. You go to Whataburger. You got car keys on your belt. So he's would basically going to be the Schneider version of. Would you, would Schneider, you be the Would you be the lone wolf or would you have like a pack? You know, that's a oh, lone wolf. Okay. So you're talking like Twilight, the teen series level of werewolf. Yeah, we're not really hurting anybody. Not like Teen Wolf, but more like you actually turn into a big timber wolf. Oh yeah, Teen Wolf okay, could I slam gotcha. dunk though. I mean, he could do the he could do the alley oops and he can dance on the car. And yeah. I think there's pros and cons to, to any of them. But um, me and Mike know, are me and Mike are right. You're wrong. You know, next, if next my question. werewolf ass was making a Whataburger run, you'd be with me. No Dracula's <laughs> going through the Whataburger thing in that cape. And See, nonsense. you're you're topic jumping. Well, uh, and as far as the tops go, I'd wear a nice little vest, kind of just in the back, like a wedding vest so you don't rip it up when you get all animaled out you come prepared i do come prepared um all right well uh skip you just so is, that, is that what we call the cold opener very cold yeah yeah okay. i'm gonna take a sip of beer maybe that'll warm things up uh as we begin here tonight skip you just got in from nicaragua uh it's obviously been i'd say all over the news but not really in the states uh very little on, the, on our news about it but if you're a cigar guy on social media you saw a lot of what was going on how are things in nicaragua have they settled well i mean it's a big country things reached a real peak there uh yeah so um what kind of set it off was um and and i'll summarize it pretty quickly but nicaragua for a long time the economy has been fueled uh, by growth from a lot of the capitalist kind of investment that's been coming in. Uh, but a lot of the government services and everything are really heavily subsidized because all of the uh, gas stations and fuels uh, for the country is nationalized. And they were getting really cheap subsidized oil from Venezuela. So they were using that big margin. They had cheap gas as well as they had big margins on the gas because of the Venezuelan subsidies. And they were using that to fund a, a lot of the programs in the government. Um, so kind of like uh, you know a, a lake that's full, fulled up. When Venezuela started uh, to to have problems and the money, the, the oil you know oil prices in general went down, and Venezuela stopped subsidizing uh, Central American and Cuban oil. The water level kind of went down, and all the ugly stuff is sticking out, right? So all of the the kind of the people using the the government funds as their own personal piggy bank i mean essentially any kind of dictatorship works off this this patronage system where where gifts favors and and lifestyles given to the people who are loyal and uh help control the the military the police the the social services so um the imf which holds or grades a lot of the bonds and borrowing uh and the currency for nicaragua basically came in and said if you don't do something about your uh, social security system, which is called INTS, it's kind of like a combination of Medicare and social security. If you don't do something about that pretty quick, it's gonna run out of money. It's gonna become insolvent. Um, there was a rule that you, had to, that you uh, had to be working for 15 years before you could participate. So when they instituted, instituted the system, there was a whole kind of like generation of retirees post-war that that really weren't part of the system because they didn't have 10 or 15 years worth of working before they were retirement age. Um, the first kind of big wave of retirees that started to hit the system, and it's that along with high health care expenses, uh, like everywhere in the world, has really put a drain on the system. So all this time they've been taking money out of it for buying houses and cars and trips and everything else for all the Sandinistas. So um, the government said, okay, well, if we have to fix it, we have to fix it. They came out with these pretty modest, you know, changes. Uh, I think from like six and a half to seven percent for workers, uh, their share, the uh, employer share went up about 70 percent. But even still, it's a pretty nominal because because wages are, are you know, the, the, that portion of it is a lot greater than wages anyway. So, um, you know, it would have cost us for, with 60, 65, 70 employees, it would have cost us something like another twenty-five or $30,000 a year. So not a huge amount of money. Right. Um, and so people came out to protest the changes. 
not so much because the changes were um, hard, but because um, they're like, well, the system is broke because you don't manage it well. You raise more money off of us. It's just more money for you to waste. And there was these peaceful protests. Um, the big piece of that was one of the changes in the rule was that people who were already drawing ints would have to contribute uh, 5% of their, their retirement pension back towards their medical benefits to pay some of their medical, which again is not a huge amount of money. If you're on you know, a $300 a month retirement and you have to pay $15 a month towards, it's not a huge amount, but it, again, it goes back to the principle of it. You add that onto the problem people had with uh, Ortega change in the, the Constitution. You add that onto the fact that he kind of named his wife as his vice president. Mm -hmm. The fact that they kind of, the elections are semi fixed in a way. You add all those kind of grievances together, and these people just said, hey, we've had enough. So they came out in the streets in big numbers. Well, the original response from the government was twofold. One, to kind of come down pretty hard on the protesters, even the peaceful protesters who were just marching. And then also to send what they call the, the Sandinista youth uh, out to kind of counter protest. So those counter protests got pretty sketchy in, in, in the big cities. And then the police just kind of stood by. And in some places the police actually helped the counter protesters. You know, they were like, there's videos of them shoveling rocks out of the back of police trucks so that the counter protesters have rocks to throw at the other guys. Oh, wow. So this, this was like maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, that, that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday got really sketchy. The, the police were shooting protesters originally with rubber bullets and then later with real guns. And then the protesters were, you know, the, you've probably seen the pictures of the, the handmade kind of, you know, cannon launchers. Zip guns? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, it got pretty sketchy. And um, that spread out to even Esteli, which is a really known as a Sandinista. Anything in the north is a real Sandinista stronghold. So um, there were a couple of uh, kids killed in that first couple of days. That made it worse. Um, eventually, I think all told, something like 35 or 40 people were killed in the protest. Um, Eventually, Ortega came out at the, at the, from the pressure from business leaders and basically said, hey, uh, hold on a second, we didn't really mean it. We're not going to change the ints. But by that point, people were like, well, that's, Cardi that's kind of beside the point. That's not what it's about anymore. So every week since then, there have been these big uh, growing numbers of peaceful protests. The counter-protesting has kind of stopped. The, the word's kind of gone out. Don't mess with the peaceful protests. So... Um, there's still this, you know, tension mm -hmm. where every now and then, you know, there's a counter protest that happens or a police involvement that people aren't happy with. And then it becomes a conflict and then it just kind of flares up. So I'm not sure where it's all going to end in terms of uh, uh, I think I think what the demands are is that Ortega uh, replace the key people who, who are basically, you know, uh, the most corrupt people, the head of the elections, the, the police commissioner already resigned um, to uh, make to make the military non-political um, and to fix a lot of the corruption, to replace his wife as vice president, and then to have free free and fair elections that are monitored by the UN. Um, I don't see necessarily Daniel Ortega giving up. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that and to be honest with you I don't know if that's even a good thing like you know if the next person comes in and and doesn't have a good plan and starts to institute a lot more you know kind of left-wing policies um, you know one of the things under Ortega people you say what you want to say but the government was pretty stable there's low crime low um, it, it's just corrupt this corruption and the the lack of efficacy in the bureaucracy that really becomes an issue so you know it's like any other developing country that you have to go through these things um, at the end of the day, it's not my place to say one way or the other. I mean, I know what my f political position would be, but really my position, Esteban's position, our position as a company has been just to continue to support our employees, always do more for our employees than what the, the law requires. Um, you know, when all of this started, one of the things we did was we, you know, we gave them all a, a bonus so that they could go out and get food, water, gas, you know, those kinds of things so that 
uh, if the, the, the supply lines from Managua have been disrupted uh, off and on. So the grocery store is kind of emptied out. The, so we've just been trying to make sure that uh, our people are safe getting to work, that they're safe getting home, and that you know their basic needs at home. You know they're not able, they're not running out of water and food because of, of these problems. Sure. So um, other than that, we've pretty much tried to stay out of it. Okay. Well, that's I'm I'm, I'm glad uh, things are taking a slow turn towards uh, a, l a little less stress. It sounds like uh, you notice. A lot of these problems are always pop up when a king or a president puts his wife in the. When they, there was just an African uh, nation where they went crazy because of his wife, uh, he promoted his wife to be like his successor, and the, everybody went crazy. And was that Black Panther? No, in real life. That was a real life. Real life. Okay. I think I, it all blurs together, but. Keep what? your wives out of your, your business. I've already finished the first cigar. Uh, yeah, I, before we move on, um, okay. I, I did want to just briefly address Nicaragua. Uh, let's briefly, we've got a whole uh, lineup here of cigars and beer. Uh, Skip, tell us a little bit about the first cigar we're smoking tonight. Uh, the very first cigar we smoked was the Weaselito, the Broadleaf version. It's essentially a half of our Cro-Magnon Atlato. Um, we bunch it tobacchiato just like we do the Atlato, full 7x38. Then we cut the bunch in half and we use the second cut of the wrapper. Um, it's a, so it's a three and a half by 38. Uh, we make it the Neanderthal, the Aquitaine, and the Cro-Magnon version. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to sell this in the States at all um, with the FDA rules. I don't know if it's kind of really a good project for Europe. It, it could be, um, but you know, we keep innovating, we keep making things we want to smoke and we keep smoking them. Yeah, that's kind of an interesting point. Uh, real quick, Yak Boy, tell us about the beer before I move forward. Uh, this beer is the uh, Firestone Walker Brewing, their uh, 21 anniversary ale, for their 21st, which is, uh, came out in 2017. Uh, Firestone Walker, located in sunny California, uh, started in 96. Uh, they have uh, done an anniversary ale for the last 12 years. Like I said, this one just for the 2017. Uh, this uh, is actually a blend of five separate uh, beers. Uh, they, they bring in all their guys, and it, it includes uh, within the final blend here their uh, Velvet Merkin, which is a, a beer. With, and all, the, all their beers are then, with this, are aged in uh, barrels from ranging anywhere from bourbon to rum. And they, so each one of their beers then gets re-aged and then they blend them together basically like a wine to create this. So the, the Velvet Merkin, the, their Parabola, Sticky Monkey, Bravo, and Hell Dorado were all used for this. And uh, coming out, this is, uh, some of them were, you know, 13.5%, 12%, uh, and then their final here is 11.8% uh, ABV. So it's it's a li it has a little bit of strength to it, but with the the way they blended it, I mean, I'm not tasting any of that. So no, it's very smooth. You know, like when you go, uh, what do you call it, mine, mine sweeping, at the party, and you take all the red Dixie cups, and you <laughs> pour the different things yeah. into, into your cup yeah. at the end of the night. You know, I don't know if you've ever done this. Allegedly, Tuttle has a pattern, but I've um, I went to I went to SFA. I've heard things. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like that, except for the craft version of mine sweeping, I guess. Yes. Well, funny thing is, we actually have every one of those beers he just read off. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, so we could cre recreate our own version of this, I guess. Uh, for for our <laughs> listeners that uh, Break aren't out the Dixie cups. <laughs> for our listeners that aren't up on uh, Skip and Mike's Instagram, we will be putting some pictures on the episode page of the the headquarters. It's changed uh, just night and day since last time we were here, but the the beer. Um, vault is mouthwateringly beautiful so we'll put some pictures on there and um, mike, mike was just at firestone actually yeah they got a really cool um it's, it's just outside of uh, la in malibu so they have a little brew pub up there it's really nice got two buildings one where they do all their sales for all the the rare funky stuff and they actually have a really good amount of some of the limiteds that you can pick up and then they actually have a full service restaurant and oh. uh yeah it's a really nice setup uh, well, cool. The, the cigar paired very well with the beer. Uh, boy, I, I got a, a real nice burn in the nose on light up, but 
then it really smoothed out. Um, yeah, these are pretty fresh too. Maybe maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, not not kind of the powerful uh, smoke I was anticipating. It's really good, really um, really mellow. But man, that beer's delicious. That's really yeah. Good. We figured after the La fiasco last time, we would start with uh, a low ABV beer. Hey, I'm going toe to toe with you tonight, Skip. You're not gonna you're not gonna beat me tonight. I've been training. <laughs> well, you've you've lined, <laughs> you've prepped. I mean, you've got your you, you ate some heavy barbecue. You've got your ride share squared away. You've got your Airbnb squared away. I literally ate seven square meals today. <laughs> you're not gonna get me. You're not gonna get me. That was the '80s Rocky montage playing in his head as Cody's just yelling at him. Right. Drink that beer. Eat the rest of that bread. <laughs> you're a bum. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna do good tonight. Um. So we got the movie playing behind us. We here. do the movie uh, playing behind us. There, a couple things real quick before we get to the movie. Um, ultimately, it, it comes down to the beer, the cigars, and the movie. But I want to talk for a minute about craft. Okay. You have been posting an inordinate amount on social media about the word craft, what it means to you, what it means to your business model. Um, there have been a lot of recently in recent history i'll I'll go back probably a year when i first started noticing a lot of other cigar manufacturers introducing that word into their their lines i know uh i think perdomo had a craft series and i think monte cristo does a one of their millions is a is a craft whatever Um, cured craft cured which is which does that mean anything it's total bullshit but yeah um so so let me let me start with a question to you. Okay. Just in the context of beer, and I'll I'll ask you, in the context of beer, this has been a there's been a whole arc from no one using the word craft to Sam Adams kind of being considered one of the very first craft brewers in Rolling Rock and Shiner and those kinds of places, all the way to this evolution of people brewing in their garages. So, to you, how do you define craft in the sense of beer? And where do you draw that line? You got to have a really big beard. I asked him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but you're right. That's number one. You can't be craft without a beard in the beer world. Well, apparently so. But, you know, the way it had been defined forever is that the, the number one craft brewer, as you just mentioned, Sam Adams. And they basically kind of set the, the, the benchmark at them. Every time they grow, that's the, that's the line for craft. But right. now a lot of people have also said, well, yeah, they've grown so big, though, they're not producing like, you know, you know, Budweiser or anything like that. So but it's still, you know, when you think of like, you know, even Firestone Walker, there's nowhere near the production level of Sam Adams. So right. So what you're talking about is to be a member of the Craft Brewers Association, which is almost like a political lobby like IPCPR. Is, yes. This is what defines your a craft brewer. Correct. Um, and that is that is one way of looking at it. In the cigar world, a lot of people kind of talk about boutique that way as well. It's like your production numbers define. Um, in some sense, the entire premium cigar market is in that kind of premium cigar category, kind of the craft brewers category, because we're very, very infinitesimal. We're like 350 million cigars out of billions of cigars when you include the whole panap- panoply yeah. of cigars. But... But what does craft mean to you? Meaning, if you go to um, Oscar Blues and they say we're a craft brewer, okay, on one end that means they're a member of the Craft Brewer Association, but on the other end, what is a real craft beer to you? If I can jump in, I see, I don't see, and this goes for most things in life, I don't the term craft to me can't be designated by an association or a membership fee or uh we we just opened up a i didn't they opened up a new uh brewery in my small little village of salado right down the road and i've been uh fortunate enough to see these guys in there every day for a year leading up to the opening of the of the brewery um to me it's getting your hands in the shit that you're talking about to me, it's knowing back and forth where you could, whether it's a cigar and you could, you know, you were physically present and can explain every component of it and why it's there. And you were part of the team that put that together. 
and not just a trained salesman telling me why that beer tastes the way it does or right. where, but you actually had your hands in, and I'm not talking about going to take a photo op of your hands in some hops and that's your Facebook profile picture. I'm talking about that's your job right. is going out and sampling ingredients and acquiring hops. And from that guy in that position to the guy up on the ladder, you know, literally in the thing up to his ass in hops and whatnot. Like to me, that's that's craft. Everything after that is kind of sales, if that makes sense. It's marketing craft. Right? It's Correct. Like the, it's like the it's like the term from a marketing perspective. Correct. To me, craft is from tits to nuts, as the doctor would say. You're there. And like I said, you don't necessarily have to be physically putting that product together, but you're there part of that process and you know it like you know your name. And, you know, I think at least maybe where this is headed is there's a lot of people in, well, you see them all the time in, in the beer industry, but if we're talking about cigars that are, are using that name, um, far outside that parameters of the definition right and what do you think what do you think total uh, I think it's actually kind of tricky because you know can you have a large-scale craft item because like uh, you know when Tito's vodka came up they actually positioned themselves as a you know a craft distillery and then when once, they don't even actually make their own vodka but yeah but once they grew, see, a lot of people don't even know that. Their right. beef with Tito's using the word craft is once they got past a specific volume. Right. Once they tipped over that volume, then they're like, you're not craft. Right. So it's, I don't know. I think there's a lot of voodoo when it comes to the term craft because it is such a marketing linchpin these days to where if you can, oh, we're going to take this Wonder Bread and we're going to slap a craft label on it, but right. it's made in the same factory that we've made our Wonder Bread for the past 50 years. Right. That kind of thing. I I don't know. Uh, I, I kind of put that if the guys that are on site making it, and you can scale up that process. You can go from, you know, X amount of units to X times 2 amount of units to X times 10 amount of units, but as long as you're still in control full control of that entire creative process down the chain of distribution, I still consider you self-craft. Now, once you've not positioned yourself that way, like if you came up, you know, it would be like Ford saying that they do craft automobiles. They can say that, and yeah, they, they produce their own stuff, but, you know, that's that's not craft to me. That's not artisanal to me. That's not, you know, the humbucker or whatever the dude you know actually putting his own bolts into it well let me, right. let me ask let me propose this right so the gentleman who who did all our tables for us and a lot of the work here bob over at uh wicked anvil if he was to come in and get a contract i mean he, he did all these pieces one-on-one -on -one. like they were designed they were created from a sketch on a piece of paper all the way to what you actually see um on the walls everything that's kind of in here but if he if you know, let's say Romo decided to go into full scale selling these types of tables and, and he scaled to that level, but he still made them. Um, would that change the definition of what he does? To me, it wouldn't. As long as he maintains control of production from top down, uh, I can still, I mean, I don't care how big you scale it, that's still him personally involved in his process is personally involved, you know, in the manufacturer, even when you scale it yeah. up. And I, mean, I don't think craft should have a, a, a limit as far as success. I mean, everybody wants to grow. And, and I think in the right circumstances, you can keep both the, the, the craft label and your business growing. It's hard. <clears throat> right. So, so, so let me let me go through a couple of thought processes that I have when when can, I'm thinking about can this. Can I get one more? Yeah, go ahead. In go ahead. All right. So you have like a, a an Amish furniture maker mm -hmm. who started out of his barn and has made himself a well known regionally. All right. If he scaled that up to national distribution and he controls that production, I still consider that craft, even if he's in like every Walmart in America. But if IKEA comes and buys him out, changes the, changes the product, changes what it's actually made of, changes how it's made of, even though they have that name, that's not craft, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense. So you guys are defined it by the size of the company, by the involvement of the owner, by the kind of, uh, to some extent, the quality of the product, to some extent, the, the whether it's local or di distributed widely. We didn't even get into quality of the product. I mean, right. You well, could be a shitty craftsman. Well, that was one of the things, <laughs> that was one of the things that you guys didn't go real deep into, but so I'll, I'll say kind of, three big categories of things. One, for me what craft is, is, I mean, def the definition of craft is something that's made by hand, mm -hmm. right? And by that definition, all of cigars and, and almost all of kind of the, the production beer we're talking about qualifies for that. You know, there's a, there's a guy involved in the process from beginning to end, yeah. you know, moving things from place to place. Cigars more so, because they're actually physically constructed by hand. It's, it's a craft industry in that sense. Um, in the sense of this, how big it is, the entire industry itself is small. You take a couple of the really big guys out, um, almost everybody that's left over, even like Drew Estate, uh, that makes you know a gazillion cigars a year, is a handcraft company with a lot of labor making a lot of things by hand. For me, what craft is, is you know, you got a guy who's a chef in the kitchen. He's got a bunch of his monstrons. He's got a, got a lot of guys there, his battalion, kind of helping him out. And, and they're all doing different things. He's orchestrating that. And then a plate comes up, and he's the one who, who puts his eyeballs on it, puts the final kind of plating on it, makes sure it's, he, it's worthy of having his name on it, and then he pushes it out to the, to the service. Um, craft is like the guy in the shop who, who's making something like a table, and, you know, he hand does the pins instead of using just kind of screws he, he does the little details that most people won't ever even notice but after it's all kind of said and done he's looking over every inch of it wiping off the fingerprints it's the right. craft is his the, is the maker putting their kind of um there's a level of pride kind of their 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 name is on it and they're putting their self into it and they're making something that they're directly connected with like you said um and in, the, in this true sense of what, what craftsmanship is, is to me, there are a lot of kind of cigar makers even that are on that spectrum somewhere between, you know, uh, there's not very many cigar companies where the guy who owns it is actually sitting there making every cigar. Yeah. And then, you know, there's companies where the, the people who make it and market it and that have maybe never have even been to a factory, right? So um, where it's just a pure marketing play. The second thing I'll say is, and <clears throat> the craft is in every single aspect of everything we do. And you could take someone new to our company like Danny and you can ask them whether it's, you know, the, <laughs> the quality of the, the, the hats and t-shirts we buy to the, you know, the toilet paper roll holder in our bathroom to, um, you know, the, the, the kind of thought we put into the tables in the factory to the shelves that hold the cigars in the aging room, to uh, the things that we kind of do, the art pieces here we do in our, in our headquarters. Everything we do is like that plate of food that goes out to service, right? Our packaging, you know, I work on that directly. Our marketing work, I work on that directly. Our relationships, Mike works on those directly. Um, you know, even in the back, when, when I'm in town or when Mike walks back there, we look at how the packaging material goes in the box, how it's sealed, whether the tape is neatly squared on the box that goes to UPS that no one ever notices except for us. So craft is in every aspect of what we do, as I've defined it. When we very first started, Mike and I were just getting together. One of the places where we would go a lot to have our discussions about how we were going to do the company and those things was Jester King, uh, south of Austin here. And Jeffrey Stuffings is one of the owners of Jester King. I think he was a intellectual property lawyer and uh, he was a, gr a garage kind of home brewer that kind of grew. He got a partner with a little bit of capital. They got combined and, and grew Jester King. And I can tell you, I'm not even a big fan of a lot of what Jester King does. It's way out there for me. Yeah. Um, you know, the the way they, they do their fermentation, the way that they, they do so many sours and, and just mm -hmm. weird stuff. I'm not necessarily a big fan of it. But 
what I really respected about it was the quality in every single thing they did. Whether it was the swag they were selling, the quality of the glasses that they were giving away, they could have gone with cheap glasses, but they went with nice ones. Yeah. The, the, the kind of the, the beer tap, the quality of those, um, the small scale of their production and how Jeff would do little tours. And back then you couldn't sell build beer at the, at the brewery. You had to actually wrap the beer into a tour yeah. price. So you would, he would talk about all the processes and you could just see the excitement and the passion about why he was doing what he was doing. And then when we had private conversations with him, you know, what Jeff talked about was his vision of the company about how, you know, they were local, they had a lot of pressure to do broader distribution, they weren't ser really interested in that, that, you know, they weren't trying to position the company to be picked up by a big brewer, that the whole name itself was based on a joke about the King of Beers. I mean, Jester King is like a play on Anheuser-Busch, the King yeah. of Beers. And so... You know, one of the th really early conversations Mike and I had was is like, what what he what you see him, the way he, you see him talking about his product, the way you see him uh, actually executing the production processes, the way you see them executing their brand, the way that they interact with their customers, their distribution growth plans, and those things. That's the way I want our company to be, and we kept going back to time and time again this conversation of. I want our company to be like one of these really respectable small to medium craft brew companies. And so in 2006, 2008, 2009, 2010, when Mike and I were having these conversations towards the end of 08, 09, 2010, um, no one, not one single person in the premium cigar business was talking about craft. What they were talking about was lifestyle. It was, yeah. you know, all the, the cigar aficionado was skewing towards kind of the rich guy demographic. Everyone was talking about the lifestyle marketing aspect of cigars. And, of course, there were all the, the boutique guys who were like, we're small, we're better, we use better tobacco, we have smaller production, we make better products. But no one was talking in the terms of craft. There were people then, and there still are people now, who I would say are their products are a, a, a demonstration of craft, right? Um, and I've been posting in the last couple of days pictures of other people's products with the hashtag craft, meaning saying this little Florida Minicana is craft. They make four or five million cigars a year. They're intimately involved. They they use their you know high quality products. They source and grow their own materials. They, they're everything in their factory is beautiful. I mean, way better even than ours. And everything that they do um, is just class. It's 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 very detail oriented, um, and it's based on the, the the eye to to the attention to detail. And there are other companies that that qualify for that as well, where they're not so much as focused on the growth and the margins and all that, or the cheesy marketing campaigns and those things. It's they're trying to be original. They're trying to make products that they're very proud of, and they're very directly connected with that work. And so. We didn't invent cigar making. I'm not from Cuba. Uh, Mike's granddad did not smuggle a bag of seeds up his culo <laughs> across to Miami. Th there's no, you know, I'm not trying to hi hi hijack that heritage. Um, I, all the pro every single process we use in our factory was done and perfected by someone before we did it. Um, not everyone does everything we do, but almost everything we do has been done by someone before. Right, so we didn't invent making cigars. We didn't even invent making cigars better. Um, but craft for us has never been a marketing campaign. It's been more of like a mission statement for who we are, how we operate as a business, and the type of products that we make. What's happened in the last, I would say maybe two or three years ago, um, somewhat along the line, caught on that the craft beer guys and the cigar guys were kind of had this like Venn diagram kind of overlap at some point and they started making products specifically tied towards the craft beer business mm -hmm. I don't necessarily even have an issue with that John Drew came out with the, the smoking monk I think was was really well executed cool art great idea it was original I didn't feel like he was trying to pretend to be something they weren't and I also felt like he was trying to be innovative right 
you look at Perdomo came out with the exact same concept after John Drew, and then now probably better executed than the two prior. Andre's coming out with this craft series. So you had the Smoking Monks craft series, you had the Perdomo craft series, then you had the Viaje craft series. Well, I think you, uh, Christian Aroa, and they had the uh, the Dragon Smoke cigar. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. but true. there was no craft anywhere in there, and that was a really cool thing. It had the milk carton, and it was original. And Tom and, and Christian are both intimately involved with all the processes that they're involved in. I would say, uh, to a large extent, the you know the Aroa stuff is a craft product, right? But the point I'm making is, then you start seeing craft cured, <laughs> crafted by Jaime Garcia. Da, da 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 and it's there's it now we filed about a year ago we filed a trademark for the brand craft because we came out and marketed and got a common law trademark for craft in 2013 and we filed an actual craft um, product brand so what's happened is twofold one people are trying to kind of ride this wave and start using this kind of concept more and two there's a I believe there's a concerted effort specifically to prevent us from getting that trademark because it's a common word and in and it's not it's probably not unique enough in the consumable goods area to get a trademark on it but in the, because people don't understand the cigar business and didn't understand that people didn't really use that as a brand I mean you've got aging room that's not an uncommon term you've got boutique blends boutique is a, is as common a word in this business as any you've got Things like the Even word rat. Liga. Liga. You got skinny monsters. If I came out with a product called skinny rat. Well, no, I remember. Uh, could, I, could I get away with that from no. a trademark perspective? Well, no, you have two companies Alec, coming out. Alec Bradley came maybe, out. With, maybe I could. Alec Bradley came out with the filthy rat, their barber pole St. Patrick's Day cigar. It was the filthy hooligan. Or, no, it, they changed well, it to the hooligan. It, it was the filthy hooligan, and they changed rat. it to the. It was filthy rat, and they drew no, state no, stepped I in. I think you're confusing two things. Eddie Ortega came out with the, the, their Dirty Dozen, which was the word dirty, apparently. So Yeah, but the first, ba the first batch of Filthy Hooligans were called Filthy Rats. I don't think they were. I don't think they were. And they actually produced them. There was some Irish, uh, there was like a, it was like Filthy Hooligan, I think it was, and they changed it to... No, it was, it's the Filthy maybe, Hooligan Maybe now. it was Drunken Hooligan or... It's the Filthy Hooligan now, it, but I remember... It was something that was supposedly... Any, anyway, my point is... <laughs> There's a, Words there, are so there's worse. three there's three <laughs> levels of right there's the hey uh, you came out with a cigar called um I don't know something that's uh, Cro-Magnon you came out with a cigar called Crave Man with a skull on it a caveman right we're we're gonna say you violated our trade dress you violated our intellectual property you're intentionally trying to confuse the consumer that you are us right you come out with a cigar called Nica Roma right we're gonna go after you because if we don't protect our marks which are worth millions of dollars yeah. millions so this is the thing is like people come on Instagram or Facebook and they'll say oh well, you didn't invent the word craft you know you're such an a-hole you're you know you're such a dick you know you're trying to claim that you just, look I'm not saying I invented the word craft I'm saying we're the very first people that use that in commerce and built our company and our brand and our intellectual property based on that and millions of dollars in equity, 15, 20 million dollars worth of equity wrapped into Roma Craft Tobacco and the time and effort and money we've put into the, the craft aspect of our business. And you're just going to come in and, and, and basically start taking that value away. We first of all have to try to protect our intellectual property. It's not. It's no fun when you have that fight in front of consumers. Okay, fine. Even if I can't defend craft and craft gets rejected by the Patent and Trademark Office, I am still going to call you out for being an uninventive, unoriginal, Wade riding, you know, backstabbing, replicating, you know, uh, bullshitter. When you saw the VIA packaging. First of all, a lot of consumers before you started going off on it uh, was it the bale, bale, best yeah. of the bales. Well, I, or I think the name was changed because I think originally there was a craft 2018, but we had just launched the craft 2018. Okay, so then this is Viaje came out uh, on the on the box. It says their craft series. It was craft 2018, 
Which was a direct, was a direct fucking thing. Okay. Na- you so know. then it changes to craft series. And then it's... Here's what a lot of consumers picked up on immediately. It looks just like Trillium. The artwork on it, I believe it was Bales, to, Best of the Bales or something. Bales on Bales. Bales on Bales. And the idea was that Andre Viaje went and picked out from the Bales of Tobacco the very best of the best. And... By the way... I don't think Andre Farkas has been within 100 miles of a bale of fucking tobacco. I don't know if that's a fact or not, but I can guarantee you, what the fuck is the best of the bales? So I go to a bale of tobacco and I say, this is the best. Well, so what is he saying? Uh, Nick Malilo, who makes cigars in that factory. Kyle, who makes cigars in that factory. Aganor Salif, who makes cigars in that factory. That they all got the substandard? A tobacco that he he got the very 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 what the fuck does that even mean the very best so he got that very best and then everybody else got what was left over it's it's just a marketing scheme well and that goes to my point a and lot it's of, completely unoriginal a lot of the consumers immediately saw the artwork on it as super similar to the tri- also trillium, not unoriginal to trillium um, I don't know if he ever responded to that as well we're homaging well trillium apparently came out and said oh that's really cool we're that's cool that you i mean look there's other people who've made boxes of cigars that look like a box of band-aids or a box of corn dogs or whatever the hell is going on out there marketing is marketing and i'm not even i'm not even um i'm not even hating on that right but what i can tell you is that a if if somebody picked up the phone and called us and said look i know you don't have the trademark on this i know you you didn't invent the word craft I know we all work in a craft business, but I would like to come out with a, a line of cigars based on craft beer, based on that concept, with kind of that kind of branding. What I very first thing I would have said is, Nick Perdomo and John Drew have already done that. So if you want to be on original and do that, then fine, go ahead. But then if you're going to put the name craft on it, actually do something beyond the marketing and the graphic artwork. Actually go down there and pick out a few bales. Don't depend on the people at Aganorsa to do that for you. If you're a craftsman, then you go down there and you decide with your own hands, your own nose, your own eyes, and your own ears what you think is the best tobacco. You make the blend. You you go down there and make, make sure the boxes are made correctly. You go down there and, and, and push the plate over the service with your, with your touch on it. And, and I won't even raise a stink about it because I'll say, you know what, you're right. But if you come out with some concept like craft cured like what the fuck is that so you're saying that you put a bunch of different tobacco of different uh primings all together in a fermentation bale so that they would marry together okay a you already branded that concept as solera from someone through your one of your other products but now you're calling it craft cured and by the way those are really low temperature inert bales because you can't You'd burn up Seco if you put it into a pilone with Lajero. So I don't know what the story is you're selling or if it really makes a difference, but when I smoke the cigar, you know, it's 12, 13, whatever, the, how much it costs. The Placencia is no tobacco. The Placencia is our craftsman. The Placencia is the, the guy that works for them is one of the best pre industry guys in the business. If he looked me in the eye and said, this really makes a big difference and here's why, try this cigar that was made the conventional way, try this cigar that was made this way, and, 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 he, and, I, would, and I, I would acquiesce to that because I trust those people's opinion. But what it really is is just a secondary label, which is bullshit, which is trying to take ride the wave on this term. So I'll say again, we don't have a, a trademark on craft. Feel free to use it, but if, if I as a consumer... And as a guy who's put millions of dollars in multiple years into putting the concept of craft into my business, I feel like you've, you're calling a bullshit play on this and, and degrading the value of that word and what it means so that it becomes what it's becoming in the cigar and the beer business where everything is craft beer and then the word actually means nothing anymore. I'm not just going to let you get away with devaluing that. I'm not saying you can't use that word because we use it. I'm saying don't devalue that word because we've put as much effort into anybody into what that means in the cigar industry. So if you're going to put craft onto your box, you know, if James Brown wanted to come out with a product from Black Sheep and called me and said, hey, I got this idea for this thing. We're going to use the word craft. It's, it's, we want to connote the same kind of thing you do, but I don't want you to feel like we're, you know, I don't want to get called out on Facebook. I'd be like, 
well, yeah, I mean, how are you doing it? It's, yeah, of course, man. You're, you're as craft as we are. Like, good. Just make it original, right? And I would never say a word about that. As a matter of fact, I would take a picture of it and put the hashtag craft because I believe that that is furthering this idea within our industry. But at, the some, at, at a certain extent, I feel like at the same time, I have a responsibility to, to kind of protect what that means in our industry because no one in the beer business policed that. Or Skip, successfully. Uh, Gene Simmons does not listen to our podcast. But God, I, I would, hope not. I would suggest if you wanted to get it really trademarked, that would be the guy that you would go <laughs> right, consult. Right, right. <laughs> but it's a two-edged sword because once he hears that term, he's probably going to trademark it himself. Right. Well, you got people like somebody posted a, some some other industry had had the, the trademark on the word craft. Had, that people who post shit like that don't even understand how intellectual property work. You have to put the category of goods in the industry that you're in. You can't just blanket trademark a word across everything that is ever produced ever. So we just talked about me actually going to the Firestone Walker Brewery. And whenever I hit L.A., I actually shot Andre a text. I said, hey, I'm in town. He said, well, let's go get a beer. Said, Was no. this prior or post? This is before. Before, okay. So, uh, so I'm at a cigar shop, comes by, picks me up. We drive about four or five blocks down to Firestone Walker. And he goes, hey, man, I'm thinking about this idea. Uh, I, really, I saw you guys come off with the, with your, you know, the La Campana. I thought it was great, great packaging. I thought it was awesome. Thanks, man. It's great. He says, hey, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm doing, you know, this idea about this craft beer series. And uh, I would love to do something with you guys. I'm like, like, we're at super capacity, you know. Um, we have no space, but uh, you know that was just kind of the end of the conversation. Like it was just like by the time we actually kind of got into the conversation, we were arriving at the brewery, so it was just kind of in and out. I didn't think much about it, and then so I, you know, we have a good time, we have a good conversation about you know industry and what's going on, and everything else, and then fly back to Houston. I meet up with Skip uh, for the Texas Cigar Fest, and we get this text message about you know, uh, you know, Craft 2018 series about to be released by Viaje and you know I didn't quite understand like if that was his attempt to say hey I'm coming out with this idea is this cool um, because we never really got into that I mean mm -hmm. at first I thought it was just a concept and uh, I mean unfortunately you know it was already done it, it was already done I mean I didn't know that until you know it's already hit the shelves you know yeah. two weeks later after that right but uh, you know it, it, it's, it kind of puts you in this funky situation because I know, you know, um, the industry is a very small industry for the most part. You see a lot of these guys over and over again. Um, by the way, we got Danny Vasquez here in the house. Thank you, Danny. Wait, look, I don't want people to think that I have an issue with Andre because I don't necessarily. I don't have an issue with people like Andre. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, the packaging is super clean. I like the homage to Trillium. At least the, the homework was done. I don't know if the cigar is any good or not. My guess is it's probably a little overpriced. Um, but at the same time, you know, I understand who Andre is, what his role in the industry is. And I've said this a hundred times before. You don't have to own a factory. You don't even have to go to Nicaragua. Actually, marketing, branding, and selling cigars in the United States in and of itself is its own skill set. And it's very difficult. There's a lot of people who are great at making cigars who've never been able to be as good as they could have been because they couldn't do that piece of it. I mean, you've got some of the greatest cigar makers in the world who you don't even know their names. Sure. And then you got people who you know as kind of cigar celebrities who don't know the first thing about how a cigar is made. And then you got people who've been doing it long enough like Andre or Matt Booth or um, John Huber or uh, those kinds of guys uh, who, who put the time and effort into finding the good partners and then they depend on those good partners, like Andre depends on, uh, uh, you know, Jacinto and Arsenio and 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 Padilla and you know all the guys that work there at Agonorsa. Um, but you know, Andre is not going out there pretending to be doing the same level of work that kind of Nick Malilo is doing, or that Saka's doing, or that uh, Pete Johnson's doing, or that uh, Dion does, or you know, etc. So. Again, I would have—I don't necessarily have any problem with Jaime Garcia saying, 
crafted by Jaime Garcia because Jaime Garcia owns a factory, works there every day, and has been in tobacco pretty much his entire life. And his dad is one of the greatest cigar makers of our generation, or, I mean, of our kind of cycle of business. So it's just the idea is if you're going to use that term, then make a product that is worthy of that term. Because otherwise, what you do is you degrade the value of that term, and then what you're doing then is you're degrading all the time and work and effort we've put into it as a business to make that term mean something. That makes perfect sense. The protectiveness over that. Like you're right. You're several. You're you're well into this game enough, and you've done so much. It makes sense to protect. Like you said, if you can't legally then you have every right to get out and make your voice heard and call bullshit when you see it. Yeah, and the consumers have every right to go, well, that doesn't mean anything in t- to me anyway. So you're, you're, yeah, just and I think, being, and I think, you're just being an a-hole. I and think I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Yeah, you, you don't have millions of dollars tied into this like we Correct. do. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's real easy to, to call the game on, on the sidelines. Uh, I think most of the reaction I saw was uh, more in line, and I, that's without this explanation. I think this explanation goes a long way to kind of give an, a, a snapshot into your mind frame. Whereas, you know, I think a lot of those guys, there is, and we've interviewed cigar makers that off the record have flat out told us, you know, we know that the Steve Sockas and the Skip Martins don't don't respect what we do because we're not, we don't own our factory and we don't. You well, know, I just said the opposite of we're that. Not, no, I'm telling you what they're, this yeah. is what we've heard from from others, and I think what you're saying is the opposite. You're saying, right. well, I think, I think the as long argument, as you're honest about your role and you're no, passionate about I, I think about the, your role. the argument comes from the, the difference between being a cigar, cigar maker but not owning your own factory. It's about being true. It's about being honest about who you are, what Correct. you do, and what your role is. Are you a it. brand owner or are you a cigar maker? And, and what is and how do you define what those two things are? I'm a brand owner. Mike and I own Roma Craft. We've put a lot of time and effort into curating our brand. Right, that is not something that is easy. Um, we are also cigar makers. Not everyone is both. And when you try to sell or position your product as superior to other products by making up a story about who you are, what your product is, and what role you had in it, that is bullshit. And as a consumer, as a, a brand owner, as a cigar maker. As someone who has a vested interest in this business, who respects the history of this business and, and, and has a big hope for the future of this business, the more of that kind of bullshit that goes on, the more you degrade the value of anything we say in the mind of consumers, which again is okay with me. You want to take all packaging off of cigars, you want to take all labels off of cigars. We started by selling cigars in Ziploc bags without labels for seven, eight bucks. And we'll go back to that if we have to. And we'll still compete and beat the pants off of 80% of the people out there because we know and believe in what we do. And we only have to convince about a very, very small number of people that, that of who we are and you know that we're, we're a differentiated product. And, and don't believe me. Don't believe what the ad says. Don't believe the blurb on my website. Don't believe what the blogger wrote. Don't be- buy the cigar smoke it is it better than other products you smoke and is it a better value and if it is then all the other stuff is bullshit and look at the end of the day most of the people that are on the edges throwing spears in backbiting or whatever you know there's an owner of a shop in fort worth the underground perfectly good guy i respect the hustle but let's be honest (laughs) you don't sell our cigars that's fine with me right you don't get what we do that's fine with me um, you want to spend more money on other people? That's fine with me. We're gonna we're gonna still eat tomorrow, but we have to be true to who we are. You can't be all things to all people, or then you're basically nothing to anybody. And so, you know, the reason why I get heated by, about this, at the end of the day, is what I said, and I'll say it for the third time, is we've invested a lot of time and effort and money in to defining what craft means within a craft industry. And we want to make sure that we protect that word and it doesn't just become an empty marketing word that just everybody can use. And by the way, the consumers that really matter, they already know it's bullshit. They already know half of the stuff out there is bullshit. 
And so that's why those companies struggle. That's why their products go through these really quick, steep life cycles. Um, that's why we sell core products that we've been selling for going on eight years over and over and over and over again. So, Quick question, industry-wise, and yeah. I'm, I'm gonna use the, the Viaje, as, as Mike said, it was brought up in a conversation, and next thing you know, oh, it's out. You talk about, and you've always talked about for years as, as we've done this together with you guys about sticking to your core lines, not deviating, you know, establish your core. And especially with the FDA, that's kind of the way it has to be. Because as you said with the Weaselito, you never know if that's going to be able. How are all these companies, even today in 2018, releasing every month? I get emails, you know, uh, brand new this, brand new that. Are these guys skipping a million steps? There's well, no there's, way, did, or there's did they really, literally file twenty thousand names? And well, there's like three ways. Um, one, I'll give you an example, like Steve Saka. When Steve Saka, who was new in the market when the deeming regulation was coming, he had a very small window of time. Robert Holt, kind of the same thing, where they actually went to the factory and basically put the framework together for multiple lines of cigars in multitude of sizes in the basic blends and got those out to retailers before August of 2016. Correct. We've talked to Steve and Robert about that hustle. I mean, so those, a- those, those things became, to be honest with you, we didn't do enough of that. I mean, if we, if we, if we would have been kind of more forward thinking, we were kind of, you know, more into doing our daily stuff, but we, we, and we weren't in a growth mindset. We would have, we would have released the, the new sizes of Neanderthal before the break. We would have released um, things like the Weaselito before the break. We would have, we would have done more things. Um, so there are those guys that have not predicate grandfather products, but pre-August predicate products um, that were on the market that then they actually do the actual full release at a later date. And, you know, I don't have a hard time believing that a lot of the big companies or the, the guys that have been around a long time that want to be around for a long time did that they had that forethought and and that's what they're doing uh, the second thing is is you can take an existing product and as long as now the guidance is as long as the product doesn't change significantly in terms of making it more addictive or more nicotine and you don't do anything to the quantity you can re-release that under new packaging new brand name anything you want so you're talking about like the lost and founds the ezra stuff we found this this unused I don't know how that stuff really falls in there. I assume if it was a product that was out before August, like there was a Camacho Liberty 2013, uh, if you found 20,000 of those, you could brand it as something else as long as you released it in the same quantity of packaging. Uh Um, I don't know that Liberty ever came out in 10 packs, but so, um, you know, let's say for example, you go buy an old brand like, you know, Florida Gonzalez or Don Nobody or whatever, and back then they had 5 by 50s and 20 count boxes, then you could re-release, say, a new brand like Wonderlust, for example, in 20 count boxes that were the exact same blend. exact same 5 by 50 in that. You don't have, I don't think it has to be the same blend. Um, that's a point of contention. No one really knows that that's true. Hmm. You can't do anything to change the distinctive flavors. You can't do anything to make it more addictive. You can't try to make it stronger. Um, so I don't know what that means. Uh, having the exact, no cigar, I mean, our cro Magnon in 2018 is not the exact same blend as the cro Magnon in 2010. If it was, it wouldn't taste anything like it tastes. So um, that's number two. And number three, there are some small companies that are like, fuck it. Uh, I'm going to get this out in the market. It's going to be sold and gone before anything ever happens. So I don't really care. You know, F the FDA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm just gonna. That's the feeling I get. Yeah, there's some of that, yeah. and and I and I don't. Even, I'm not even hating on those guys either. Like, you know, you take the we, risks. We can't do that because we want to build a sustainable, sure. large, long-term business. But if you know, if you know, um, like Danny had the voyage. If Danny wanted to release, you know, seven new products just to make you know some money before he shut the thing down, I would I wouldn't have hated on him for that. Sure. So, um, you know, there are some things that we're doing. Like, for example, we're taking our Aquitaine EMH making it a barber pole. It's still Ecuador Habano, it's still basically exactly 99% the same tobacco. It's in the same quantity box. Um, we box pressed our mandible. That's a limited edition for us now. 
we uh, you know you know the firecracker for example is a is a predicate product that's been coming out from before 2007 under two guys but every year it's a completely different brand a completely different blend right but they consider that a predicate product so why wouldn't um you know what if i wanted to you know create a new cigar called you know cro magnon um you know two or something and make it a completely different blend right um like if we had if we didn't have aquatane theoretically we could because Aquitaine is the exact same sizes and quantities as Cro-Magnon, we could have theoretically come out with a third Cro-Magnon line, as long as you know they're basically essentially the same weight of tobacco, the right. same quantity of cigars. So, you know, I don't know the answer to your question. But I think there's a mul- there's a bunch of different answers. I think that is the answer. It's just yeah. Well, let's take a quick break for a second to talk about the Tobacco Special at Drew Estate. Uh, they have taken the art of blending premium cigars to new heights, slowly infusing the ultra-rich Nicaraguan tobaccos with the finest coffee essences from the fertile, lush mountains of Hinotega and Manta Galapa, offering in two varieties the Negra, a dark, rich Maduro broadleaf, and Dulce, a smoother shade Connecticut smoke. Tobacco Special is pure tobacco velvet on the palate with a divine aroma. So head on out to your local brick and mortar shop or your online retailer and pick yourself up some tobacco to pair with the morning cup of Joe. You will not be disappointed. Oh yeah. Um, real quick before we move on, I think we've all moved on to the um, the Wonderlust. I am embarrassed to say it's my first Todd. I know you've had a couple. Um, tell us a little bit about the Wonderlust, Skip. Uh, the Wonderlust is Brazilian Matafina. Uh, the fillers come from multiple countries. We don't really get into a lot about the fillers. The binder is a basuki wrapper from uh, Indonesia, or binder from Indonesia. Um, it is a product that we make in three sizes, Robusto, Petit, Bellicosto, and Toro. Um, we also make a fourth size, a Grand Corona, that really we call the Fiorella. Uh, that has a little bit of a different blend. But that cigar uh, we sell only in Germany through our distributor, Schuster. And, um, it's delicious. Thank you. Um, and then we're drinking the next beer is the Chaco Vesa, which is uh, made by Stone. We've done quite a few Stones on the show. Yes. Uh, this is my favorite by far. The from Stone, Stone. Uh, also from California, also started in 96, uh, same time as Firestone Walker. Uh, they are located in um, Escondido, uh, the southern part of California, more towards San Diego. They are... Um, the Stone Pale Ale is, is pretty much their their flagship. That's the one they've produced the longest, uh, has the most sales, but their most famous brand is Arrogant Bastard. They've carried on with that. And so we, we did that on the show. Or the du- we, did the, the, we did the Double Bastard. Double Bastard. And uh, the Arrogant Bastard, of course, the tagline being, uh, uh, you are not worthy. But the this one is actually uh, came out in uh, 2014. Uh, a was a came from a contest that they they hold every year to for home brewers to to come up with a blend and submit it to them for to possibly take on the gentleman that came up with this one a uh, chris banker won the the competition in 2014 uh and this one is uh influenced by mexican hot chocolate um this is actually referred to as a mocha stout uh, the abv is 8.1 pussy about, beer <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe we're going backwards. I can I just tear it? Hey, we got, it, we got him on record. This is his favorite stone. <laughs> this qualifies as sessionable for us. Uh, the the IBUs are uh, right around fifty, and then of course, as I said, the is is based with uh, using uh, the Mexican hot chocolate to be brewed with, which includes uh, cocoa, coffee, vanilla, cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, peppers, and just. I have never had it before, so this. It reminds be me a little bit of the St. Arnold uh, Mexican chocolate beer we drank a, a couple it's episodes ago. It's like a latte. Ago. Yeah. What was the? I'm I'm loving this because even though it's it's you know it's got a, like a or trying to pitch a chocolate profile between the retro hell of the Wonderlust and the backbite of the Stone, I'm getting a ton of Grand Masala, and I love that flavor. I know that's not your thing. I, you know, no, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, yeah. I was always, uh, I always like harken back to when, whenever we're trying to describe flavors, 
there was a conversation I overheard you talking about one day, and you're like, oh, I don't get into that shit. I just taste, <laughs> I just taste Lajero. I taste uh, Jalapa. I taste all this. But I don't know the individual tobaccos as well as you, so I choose Gram Masala. <laughs> the, the retro is the retro right is amazing now. on the cigar, it's, and um, it's certainly unlike anything else in your in your catalog. Um, it's man, it's I'm a little uh, kerflunked by it. I, I really like it. Yeah, so this cigar is actually um, medium in body, but fuller in strength in terms of the nicotine and of the fillers. Whereas this beer is really full bodied, yes. but medium in strength. Yeah. So I think it's a great kind of combination to compare. I mean, this drinks, you would think it has lactose in it, but it almost drinks like a milk stout. Yes. Because it's so creamy, but it's actually an imperial stout. Hmm. So I'm not sure exactly how they pull that off, but. Um, you know, there's, it kind of goes back to that classic kind of confusion that consumers have between body and strength. Yeah. Yeah, we get that a lot on the show lately with, we, we get beers described as, you know, an American IPA that has zero hop or bitterness presence. It's just pure grapefruit, and it's like nothing like an American IPA, but... Uh, I thought you were going to say we get the comment a lot that our podcast has a lot of great mouthfeel. <laughs> I get those private messages. I didn't know you were looking at them too. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a great beer, though. The 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 barrel aged version of this is probably one of my top ten beers of all time. I'm it's I'm, lo- I'm loving the spice on this that it gets in the backside the here. Spice is yes, great. I mean, everything mixing back there just it's amazing. It it almost drinks a lot like a light version of Prairie Bomb to me. I don't remember that one too well. <laughs> that was one of the ones that disappeared into the ether. Mm-hmm. Go on with this prairie bomb. Um, it is very good, and uh, just I just uh, can't say enough about the cigar. Uh, you know, one thing you were saying, and I, and I think there is, uh, I don't want to jump backwards too much, but we do see it a lot where, you know, because we've been doing this for a few years, um, either people will come to us and, you know, want to start a podcast or ask for you know how, how do you know nothing about the the what goes into this and how to even get started and whatnot but you know they're like yeah I, I, i've watched a couple episodes of your podcast and yeah like i well first of all it's always when can i come on there and it's like well <laughs> there's a lot of work that goes it's not really a you know it's when can i come to your factory and make a cigar yeah uh we kind of have a a, a a a thing we do uh, but we will help, you know, if you're interested in like the techno- technology side. But then, you know, like, well, yeah, it's like, you know, me and my buddies love to watch movies and, you know, we could talk. And it's like, okay, well, you know what? We do take a an ownership in that, you know, we are kind of the, the first, as far as I know, cigar podcast to kind of try to reach out to, to other folks, to movie folks, to beer folks, and to kind of meld them all together. And it's like, well, no worries. There's plenty of craft cigar brands coming to. Co- well, there's definitely go. some craft podcasts. There's definitely some craft <laughs> podcasts. Um, it's it, but you do get very protective over what you've spent. You know, we're coming on four years of this. You get very protective. Well, all right, but then again, you kind of, at least I kind of take a step back. It's like you know what, uh, go forth, young man, and just you know, if you think it's as easy as slapping a, a cool picture on a box and selling a cigar. Or if you think it's as easy as turning on microphones and watching a movie and you and your buddies getting drunk and talking. Actually, um, that part is pretty damn easy. <laughs> but there's a lot of work that leads up to that drunken night. But, I mean, it's just like... <sighs> I mean, like, I did a podcast today with these two young guys. <clears throat> they're doing, uh, I think they're in Florida, and they're doing a podcast called uh, the Hot Ticket Podcast. The Big so, Six. It's Ohio, right? Big Six. Yeah, it's Ohio. Yeah, so there are two young guys, and I love the podcast because they're kind of where I was, like, you know, five years into smoking cigars, but a lot more technology than we had back in, you know, the 90s. Hmm. So, um, you know, they're basically, through the medium of this podcast, exploring relationships with the with the makers, um, exploring kind of things they're smoking and, you know, you know things they like things they don't like things they like in the business things they don't like in the business things they like about the culture things they don't like about the culture and you know there's a lot to be said for the kind of level of professionalism 
that you know half will and coop and you guys and and developing pallets and you know um the guys that came before you guys like you know nice tight ash and doc um, stogie fresh Sto doc stogie fresh and and stogie review guys that have been around for a long time doing a basic thing what they do like stogie guys um it's it's obviously not an easy thing to do there are different levels just like in cigar making right there there are people who are hey call me on my phone and we'll do a conference call basically and then there's people that are doing the full-on kind of travel log and then they're all the way up to these guys that are doing this hand-rolled movie right yeah. so you know again it's about being humble and being about what you're doing about it about it, as they say you know and, and not trying to to fake the funk not trying to pretend like you're doing something that you're not or like you're some kind of deep industry insider you know you guys aren't doing cigar news you're not doing no we're very clear about who yeah, we are you're doing your own thing and we're very so. comfortable uh yeah, i just with, with i'm i'm almost crying at the fact that i've heard our podcast mission with professionalism <laughs> I am just, don't uh don't sell short uh but no i mean it's just it is something you just take pride in and when someone is cutting corners or coming in uh i guess at a certain point you just kind of want to step back and say all right when you get to 50 when you get to 50 then you know proofs in the potato we'll see how we'll see how you how you do well but i don't know there is there is kind of i think you, it'd be wrong not to get kind of pissed off if you see someone um well i mean i get, coming at it in, i get pissed off and i don't even have you know vast understatement we don't have your capital investment in the product but even when somebody does hey we're doing a movie night on our thing there's a part of me that's like oh fuck you yeah that's completely <laughs> exactly you know that's exactly right it's like wait that's completely not original it's like get your own thing that's my thing <laughs> you know uh your, your buddy mike cigar hustler starts to start his podcast yeah and uh i'm like oh i like mike started listening to it opens it up with everybody's hustling and i'm like you know, we've been using that song for about two, two and a half, three years, starting our show. Fuck yeah. you, Mike. Uh, but <laughs> well, he, he is the fair, cigar hustler, he, he probably, and I like Mike. So, I well, you know, or watch one of you. But we actually had a guy do a cover actually, of it. Actually, he's so been could, on the so, show. Yeah, yeah he, was on the show he was on the show, but did he go back and listen to it? Well, uh, he, had no, he had no choice to be on the show. But they're not time. they're not using the, the, the version that you're using, so eventually they're going to get gassed. They're going to get gassed. Yeah. We're okay. Yeah. We paid. We got our guy to do a, do well, a cover. Of so, you know, Mike's one of my closest friends. I love Mike. I would say almost like a mentee, I, I would say. I know he sees your relationship right? very much. So, so um, deeper than just a business relationship, we're friends. But his whole entire podcast is about the origin story. Mm -hmm. And that's the number one thing I hate to talk about on podcast. <laughs> so, so he likes, can you come on the podcast? I'm like, we're not, I don't want to redefine what your podcast is, sure. but I'm not doing sure. my origin I'm story. I'm not a fucking bad Unless you want to go back to, I was born a, a poor black child. Right. Um, we can go back that far, then then we can. Then I'm we not can. a I'm not a fucking Batman movie. You don't need to show <laughs> pearls drop into the street right. one more damn time. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, we're all enjoying the well, we're all enjoying the the wonderlust and the stone beer. Um, if you don't have anything else, Skip, uh, we do have a movie to talk about. Oh sure. yeah. Uh, anything else, Mike? Anything else you want to get off your chest, Mike? You brought in the mics. This is your chance. Fuck all you motherfuckers. Like it. By the way, it. Mike, you're looking. Fuck really all you good. hoes. Thank you. Thank you very you look, much. You look like a totally different person from uh, last time yes, we saw you. About uh, ninety something pounds. Oh my dear God. Oh God, is this the nutrition section of the podcast? <laughs> yeah, he hates it. He doesn't like it. He sent, so, me, he sent me a text Mike, message the other day. We, let's so do let me origin tell you. story. Where were you when you decided? Oh, to? let me tell you something. This is this is uh, an interesting <laughs> thing. So, I have a, like a new scanner thing that picks up anything about Mike Rosales or anything about Roma Craft or anything about whatever. Like a Google Alerts kind of deal? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I get this thing that says there's a podcast with Mike Rosales. And I'm like, well, Mike wouldn't have done a podcast without telling me. <laughs> and it's some like Austin Nutrition Center oh. and it's talking about ketogenics and, you know, Mike's journey, along his health journey. And, hey, I'm here with Mike Rosales from a cigar company. I know that's kind of weird. You know, the the... the the, the, the typical kind of we got to talk bad about tobacco a little bit sure. and, then, and then we get into so anyway I listen to this thing and I listen to the whole thing first of all most time as you can see when Mike and I are on podcast together I do like 98.7% of the talking we're used to it. we know the we right. know the drill <laughs> right kind of like you with, with <laughs> Tuttle right so um, I would can I 
just one. Yeah. <laughs> so so my, Mike talks through the whole thing, and and I listen to the whole thing, and I'm like, oh man, you know, if I didn't know anything about, but know Mike, this is really super interesting. So then uh, later on, I was like. Uh, Hey Mike, man, I listen to your podcast. He goes like, "What podcast?" I'm like, "This podcast." And it's like almost like he was trying to keep it a secret from me, <laughs> like yeah. a dirty, like you know, mm -hmm. Mike's out there getting healthy. He doesn't want us to know about it, yeah. you know. And it's like you know, we're not judging. It's like we're running his street cred, you know. Yeah, we're not it's judging. like it's like the the rapper who starts going, or you know, when Stringer Bell started going to college at night, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. You know, he's gonna ruin his he's gonna ruin his street cred by going to community college and studying. Uh, for business. So about uh, two weeks ago, Skip sends me a text message. So whenever uh, Chicago Cubs were playing in the World Series, we flew up and went to Game Five of the World Series. Jealous. <clears throat> yeah, suck it. So the, uh, <laughs> and we had great, great seats. Great seats. Fuck so you. The um, <clears throat> so he takes his picture. We're like outside somewhere, and we've got like fucking hot dogs, hamburgers. Ice cream, <laughs> fucking sundays that are fucking yay big, you know. And I've I've got like a full mouth full of like, you know. <laughs> and he he snaps the picture and then he so he kind of held on to it and he texted me. He goes, "I miss my boo." Oh, you ain't, like, you ain't about that life. You ain't about this life anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like it's, you might have to about to get jumped out of this this lifestyle. Have you, I guess you haven't had a dilly dog from Chicago. From Dairy Queen. Rangers Dairy. Stadium now is offering a Dilly Dog. The doctor uh, just went out to Arizona to spring training. They core out a pickle. Oh, I've heard of this. Slide a yeah. hot dog in it, batter it up, deep fry it like a corn dog, and uh, apparently it's... Well, he didn't have one. It's, not, it's, not, it's not keto approved. Mike ain't about that. <sighs> well, oh, you, know you look great. Thank you, thank you very around. much. We'll talk afterwards. Maybe I need to get on your program. No, that, this is when you know Skip gets into that. Oh fuck! There's 20 minutes. Here's what of, really uh, happened. Health, he, he, health he blames it on his picture, but By what way, really happened was nice, Mike I'm came to see me in the ICU, almost dying, right. and then you know going through heart failure and everything. And Mike's like, "Oh shit, uh, we're making money now." I one of us, one of us, one of us has got to fucking stay around. <laughs> Actually, what it was is when someone goes, "Man, you're fatter than Skip," and I was like, "What?" <laughs> that was what? Esteban. Uh, it was Esteban. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, it is. You know what? Uh, and uh, obviously, we're off tangent here, but it is a weird thing. Cody, how much weight have you lost? Uh, probably getting close to about forty pounds. Forty pounds in the last six months? Oh no, no, no! About a year. About a year. Yeah. Your, doing skin, cross. your skin's looking great. Oh, thanks. Some CrossFit. <laughs> he's lifting. Hey, he's, I mean, he's just. But every week when he comes in for the podcast, who is the one stumbling around miserable? Oh. Oh, I'm so sore. I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. I hate everything. We're yeah. me and Todd are happy. We got our I mean, we got I, our dilly dogs. I heard on the podcast. <laughs> I think it was our po podcast where you started with you know the the uh, Point Break having to make trade offs. And how your lifestyle was, your health was going to have to suffer. Your, yeah. Okay. You know, so it was a pre. It, you made a decision. It wasn't an accident. No. You're not weak. There are no accidents. Right. Um, but. Uh, you know, it is funny when people hear you're a cigar smoker. Tut tried to get a uh, interview with uh, Curtis Armstrong, Booger from Revenge of the Nerds. Nice. He uh, actually he, talked to him. He just I wrote. An, he him. just wrote an autobiography, and we're like, "Hey, come on the show. We'll do Revenge of the Nerds," which apparently you're not allowed to do, talk about anymore because there's rape in it, and that's at the end where the nerd screws the I hot chick in, in the jumpy, in the Darth Vader jumpy, mask. Jumpy house. And yeah. now that's oh, he raped her. You can't talk about that. It's not a nerd victory anymore. It's me too. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. I don't know that rape has ever been cool. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but that was never considered rape up until someone... I mean, if you had sex with un someone under the pretenses that you were someone else, I, I think that... Here's the oh, thing. no, no. It when was we, rape, but no one ever... Look, I don't have any issue with people as a society going, you know, we're not so cool with that anymore. <laughs> no, you absolutely. Know, we, we've just reached a point of evolution where we're not cool with that anymore. Yeah. Like... Okay, at some point the Frito Bandito commercials had to come off the air. Okay, cool. The Aunt Jemima bottle is going to have to at some point change, right? The, there, there's just certain things where you evolve as a culture and go, okay, you know what? Now that we're a little more woke, that's not cool anymore. But what about all the high school chieftains? But does, does so, so but, but but it's completely unfair to go back in a fucking time machine and hold people accountable. Correct, and there's for people, shit they did twenty years ago. Correct, and there's there's a you wouldn't believe this, but there's a very large sect of not, e not only film fandom but film criticism reviewers 
that are all for going back and, and washing out some of these early movies. Don't take away my three amigos. <laughs> Don't. Please. Well, that whole movie would have to go away, probably. I know. I mean, when you put it in the yeah, Fido Bandito context. But that's such bullshit. It is. But, uh, but what, go back it's to like my... It's like trying to take the N-word out of Tom Sawyer. Correct. But going back to my original point, uh, Curtis Armstrong, Booger, you know, tut pitched the show to him. He's like... Oh, well, I don't drink beer and I don't smoke cigars, so I don't know what we would have to talk about. I'm a scotch guy. Yeah, no, and it's like, like, we drink scotch with our beers and you're like our hero. We grew up worshipping Booger. He's like, eh. The, the whole c- cigar. beer and cigars thing. Well, I would imagine him doing interviews about Booger is kind of like Harrison Ford and Han Solo. But, but I told him it wasn't just about Booger. It was about everything all the way back from his moonlining days right. to his uh, supernatural days. Uh, I think we lost him at Stogie's. We in, lost uh, him at Stogie's. We lost him at Stogie's, which teach their own. I mean, I they're airbrushing pictures of cigars out of Churchill pictures. Winston Churchill pictures. It's like, really? Yeah. Really. That's That, that just defeats history. Right. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's a sad state it's of affairs, It's like trying to friends. take the whip out of Thomas Jefferson's hand to pretend like he wasn't a slave owner. I don't know if, I don't know if there is a, a, a painting of Thomas I've, Jefferson I've as never a slave seen, owner. I've never with seen a whip. that painting. <laughs> but you get the point. Yeah. What kind of paintings are you I mean, looking up, Skip? Look, Thomas Jefferson was Thomas Jefferson. Nobody, nobody respects the slave owner aspect of it, but we've moved past that. But you can't go back and say that negates the Declaration of Independence because we can't talk about the Declaration of Independence because Thomas Jefferson... You know, father a child with a slave. Of course not. History's messy because people are messy. Uh, right. That's just kind of the way it is. Okay. Well, before we get into tonight's movie, um, seems like this always happens at Roma. We talk, we talk, and eventually we'll get to the movie. Um, well, these are your, probably your most downloaded, best episodes. So. Uh, um, well, the Sokka episodes do pretty good. We don't fact check that. Yeah, Sokka's great. <laughs> uh, and you guys are too. Uh, we, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, you know, you know. While we're talking cigars, we do this once every year or so. So, actually, our Black Irish review, uh, the standalone Beyond the Pod that Cade wrote, just a written review of Black it's Irish. Pretty, it's like one of the top eight things that we've done. Hmm. Maybe you guys will share it now. Oh. Yeah, it's weird that the Black Irish is uh, so popular because it's ninety nine percent. The Cro-Magnon EMH. Yeah, so. I, I really enjoy it, but I, I'm a Cro-Magnon fan, so that was... Also, uh, I, I, I review in the H-Town Lancero, which is actually, I think, my favorite by Tolo of the, the, Cro, the Cro-Mag line. I just... Wait till you smoke the HS, the the 5 and 3 quarter by 46. Uh-huh. We're going to smoke the KFG today, the um, the 5 by 56, but or I think it's 4 and 3 quarter by 56, but... I was trying to get us to do the uh, H-Town Lancero on the show last year, and they, they kept coming out of stock at Stogie's, and I finally got a hold of one and just did a written review for it, and, man, I fell in love with that stick. Uh, it's just Well, the, the the Weaselito, the San Andreas Weaselito, mm-hmm. is half of that. That's what I figured. It was just half, yeah. half that. The Weaselito was beautiful. But, I liked yeah. it. Well, it's just the, 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 you know, we talk about craft and skill. Taking that many blends or that many origin leaves – shrunk down into a Lancero. I mean, that's impressive. It is uh, very impressive. So, I mean, I, I think if we had had on the show last year, it would have ranked. But, I mean, you guys did come in at number, I think, number three in our, our top ten last year for the Knuckle Dragger. I think we did the Knuckle Dragger last year that scored really. I think you guys made the top, our top uh, ten, like number it. three or so. I like it. I like it a lot. Do you guys remember how you celebrated around here when you made the Tuesday Night Cigar Club top ten list? I think we have a plaque in the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, did it? Yeah. Uh, where Tuttle left it, hung his glasses on it. Um, man, speaking of beautiful Mike, man. I, oh, wait. I, I, <laughs> We're joined right. now by Mr. Danny Bosquez, the newest team member uh, here at Roma Craft Tobacco. Okay. Welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You've only Danny, been, you've don't, only take, been, don't take a nap, man. These guys take pictures, and they show it all over the place. Oh, no shit, right? That's the, uh, that was like the number one it's piece not of even, advice. It's not even a year, right? <laughs> no, no. I started at the end of September, yes. Yeah, so okay. A little over six months. Uh, yeah, so in that six months, I think it's actually worked about three. So let's just, let's just put an asterisk. Is this on. type of ball busting pretty much? No, well, it's pretty accurate. But yeah. the, <laughs> I, I made a I made a statement today that you know some people just negotiate better than others. So you know, I think he had he, he got thing. here. Uh, he did his post move leave, and then he did his baby leave, and then he did his. I was vacation. right. Congratulations! You got Thank and you. then he did Appreciate more vacation. Um, but you originally started, you had your own line. Correct. The Voyage. Right, right. And 
was it I from what I do to FDA the uh, the small man talk about a, a perfect example of right. a one man company getting crushed by regulations that was you right yeah um, yeah it was you know really me and my wife kind of pushing most of that and uh, that was it it was just kind of tough and the fact of not being able to come out with anything new or work on anything or you know I mean I wasn't in a position to waste money just to potentially come out with something right sure. so where I could have probably gone on for another year or so with the the voyage and and whatever i kind of had to put it into a scale of like you know where is this ended up going and uh, you got a family you got kids yeah you know factors and, into it right right and it was at the time a part-time thing i had a full-time career and um and my decision to not go to the show in 2017 was kind of like the final thing like you know if i if i'm not at the level where i'm going to do that i'll I'll never be able to get to that level. So then, yeah. you know, what am I doing, right? So, just kind of made that conscious decision to go out when I wanted to, and uh, and yeah, that was it. But you know, at the time, you know, it was a great learning experience. I learned, I, I met some amazing people, learned an incredible amount about that. You know, this side of the of the industry that most cigar enthusiasts, cigar fans, either never really get to experience or don't know sure. much about, or would probably get turned off if they knew, you know, a lot of the the real uh, nuts and bolts. And, uh, well, I knew, I knew you when, uh, when Skip and, and Mike brought you on board here at Romacraft, I had just kind of had the name recognition that you're real big on Facebook cigar groups, yeah. um, which, you know, I've been... That means you had to look up who the fuck I was. Uh, no, actually, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I kind of got, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, president of the Cats group. You better, oh, yeah. you better act somebody. Uh, yeah. Just... If you didn't know. I'm I'm uh, so I, I'm kind of uh, knee deep in that world, sure. and uh, you, you've always been very active in there. So no, I immediately knew who you were. Were you guys fans of the voyage? Um, no, I don't know that. I honestly, I don't know that I'd ever smoked a voyage. I'm a big fan of Guillermo Leone and, and the stuff that La Aurora does. Um, I've smoked it since. It's a great cigar. Um, um, I was more interested in in the fact. What I was really interested in was Danny's kind of startup, you know, because the struggle kind of hardens the iron or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So I like seeing Danny going through that process um, at, at his age, at his kind of where he was in life. And really, you know, when we kind of reached out to him to become part of the team, um, there's a lot of guys who are interested in, in working in the cigar industry and there's a lot of guys in the industry who would who would be interested in working with us mm -hmm. i mean it's actually a really good gig to be honest but um the fact a lot of the things that played in danny's favor was that danny had gone through that and and really had a realistic perspective of how hard it is to build a brand how hard it is we didn't really want somebody coming in on kind of the peak you know kind of our upscale of the success and 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 then going oh well this is easy without having yeah no experience at that struggle or any context right, right. that makes that makes perfect sense and, and also i mean you know you guys are always kind of in a limited re you know as far as expanding out to realize you're so selective and there's you know there's a back order situation and it's you know the fact that you were finally at a point where you could bring on someone to the sales team um yeah you kind of want to make sure it's the right guy well, yeah, and, and we don't look. We didn't really look for someone who was like us. I'm my own person. Mike is a completely different person than me. Um, Danny is a completely different person than Mike and me. So, um, part of it is you know you have it's like the old cartoons where you have the you know the seven characters that all have different kind of superpowers or whatever, and that's really kind of the you know what we were looking for someone that would augment the skill set of the team, uh, but still kind of be at the same DNA to fit in yeah I think we kind of subscribe to that philosophy too <laughs> so um, what's it been like it exceeded your expectations no no yeah absolutely and, I, and I, this is not the first time I've said that you know because it was it was an absolute career pivot that I did um, and I have a family a fairly good sized family right that um, kind of jumped on board with me um, as I've so far haven't let them down and we moved to Austin for it um, and um, I, where well, Romacraft is established, and they are, it's a great company. It was still a roll of the dice, right? Like if if I would if it would have worked out, or if I'd come in and like, man, I don't get along with any of these people, and this is terrible. And Skip is as big an asshole as he is on Instagram and real life, right? <laughs> so it's like 
it was still a gamble, but it was a, it was like a five day interview process where I kind of met everybody, and um, one guy that did have have to Google who I was was Mike. He didn't know who the fuck I was, and uh, we were stuck together for like two or three days immediately, and we kind of just gelled like right away. You know, it wasn't awkward. It was we just got along. We have a lot of the same personality traits. So to even now, I'll call somebody and they'll think I'm Mike, or I answer the phone like, "Hey, Mike." You're like, no, it's not. You know. I mean, I'm sort of kind of I get a little jealous sometimes he, of the, the, the growing relationship with Mike and Danny <laughs> like ah these guys are in their you know size 32 34 pants <laughs> and I'm like oh, fuck man. so you know I'm not it, jealous of that by the way no. uh, a little side note uh, for the for the uh, cover sleeve when Mike lost all his weight I, I immediately came into just like this doubled my wardrobe <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Lauren yeah, a bunch of polos yeah. nice nice yeah. Uh, well, good. I mean, it, it certainly seems like you three have got a um, a winning thing going. So, uh, yeah, congratulations, man. Yeah, absolutely, it's an easy it's an easy product and, and thing to kind of really sell. I mean, it's it isn't really so much selling. It's 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 customer service. It's just taking care of our current customers. And, what does uh, craft mean to you, Danny? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he. I'm glad he changed. It. Day go. six of the interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, awesome. All right. Well, uh, before we get into the movie once again, we have another beer. Um, Yak Boy, what are we? This is from Trillium Brewing Company. They're located out of uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, founded in 2013 by a uh, couple, uh, JC and Esther uh, Tetrialt, I believe. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, they basically just, you know, with uh, the help of family and friends uh, gathered up enough funds and started small uh, out of the uh, Fort Point neighborhood in Boston and then uh, managed uh, did have done well enough that in 2015 they opened a larger one in Canton Massachusetts Uh, and uh, tonight we're doing their pot and kettle which is a oatmeal porter made with uh, cold brew coffee uh seven and a half percent we seem to be going down yeah what's up skip don't worry we're about to get to the uh, to the all 10 right. i feel like all, i feel like that? all those beer push-ups were for nothing i gotta tell you is there anything left in that? uh it is empty my friend yeah it's not a, it's not an accident that we went with these low abv beers um <laughs> You know, we recorded about four hours worth of material for the last one. I think you, we, you guys featured about the 30 minutes we did before we hit the fourth beer. You know, so. Jerry Lewis made this Nazi clown movie, uh, The Day the Laughter Died or something it's like, like that. It's kind of like Uncle Remus. It's like forever in the vault. He swore even upon his grave that he would be buried with that footage. I will be buried with our footage from the last <laughs> Roma Craft episode. Uh it's nothing my children need to see, or uh, I, I betrayed all rules of decency. And so this is another one that's. I have that footage, and like every other week, I'm still watching. It. <laughs> that's a spank bank, you know. So, so um, this is another medium strength, full body um, stout. Um, you know, again, I, I've kind of gotten more into the into the. I, I'm always a kind of the full body stout kind of thing. I think the kind of craft of beer making really expresses itself best in the stouts and in the IPAs. And I'm not a big IPA guy. Um, you know, like a lot of our beers here at the headquarters, I think we have about 4,000 different beer, or 4,000 bottles of beer, probably about 1,250, 1,300 different labels. Um, we're big fans of Trillium. We're big fans of Treehouse. We have a, uh, a guy who's a Roma Craft guy up in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, who sources these for us. Um, and, you know, just like we have guys kind of all over the country, we have California guys, we have, you know, um, and we kind of buy and trade with those guys, the special releases. <clears throat> Trillium is one that's kind of in the last six months of year has become bigger for us. Um, I chose this beer to pair with the cigar that we're smoking. Yeah, we're about there. This is the... Uh, so this year we came out with Craft 2018, mm-hmm. which was the second um, kind of since we started with Craft as a theme of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, the Craft 2018 was the Neanderthal blend with a Ecuador, Connecticut Candela with um, a Pennsylvania Broadleaf. 
this is and that was two complete wrappers correct an entire candela and an entire broadleaf it wasn't a yeah it was a, yeah, two even though you wrappers. only saw no it's the whole thing if you took the outer wrapper off there's a hole that's what was so unique about it. yes you only saw glimpses of the candela but it actually ran the entire length of the cigar yeah so it works like a home. barber pole would work yeah it just doesn't have the outside aesthetic of a barber pole um this is the Cro-Magnon blend with an Ecuador Connecticut uh, bind, uh, double wrapper with the U.S. Connecticut broadleaf. So uh, when we did 2013, it had Ecuador wrapper, Ecuador Habano, and we did the broadleaf version, uh, smaller production for a specific event called the Witchcraft. Uh, this year we did Craft 2018. This is the Craft, the Witchcraft 2019. So this is a cigar that's going to come out next year. Um, since you know this show we've kind of done the Weaselito, which may never come out We've done the Wonderlust, which is a European cigar We're doing this one which comes out next year and then we're going to do the KFG the the European Neanderthal, so um, You know we don't do these kind of cigars specifically to Say hey, hey here's some cigars you can't get right and we're really featuring these a because they went really well with these beers But also just to highlight that you know every single day. We're still innovating creating new products. Um, the FDA may limit what we can do from a marketing perspective or what we can sell here, but that doesn't prevent us from wanting to, to you know, even if we're just gonna make products that we just smoke ourselves here in the office, um, then that's what we're gonna do. So, um, I mean, that's, that's who we are, so. Well, you never know. Any day now, Trump's going to get rid of those regulations, and it'll be <laughs> or a, the Republican Congress, it'll or be, the Republican Senate, yeah, or, or the Republican judiciary. judiciary. That's yeah. why they're there. They said they were going to do it. So, or yeah. the voters said they were going to do it. So, uh, is that one of the reasons you stepped away from Facebook? Just couldn't handle the 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 trolls. The, the no, I I have no problem with arguing people on Facebook. It just started to consume too much of my time, and yeah. you know, honestly, I don't mind having a discussion if I feel like there's a chance that I'm going to somehow sway your opinion with facts and reason there's no swaying yeah there's no swaying so it just became a an exercise in futility i started to look around and noticing that really successful people who have good fulfilling lives didn't spend a lot of time on facebook they don't do that so I i've tried to ad adopt the eighth habit of, <laughs> of, of those people we're lucky and everyone who doesn't like what we do they choose private message to tell us their disgust <laughs> and their uh, their issues uh, well is that Unsolicited, or is that like you do with me, where you go, "Hey, what did you think about this?" <laughs> no, 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 completely unsolicited. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, we, we fuck you, Skip. <laughs> <laughs> What's my name? Fuck uh, you, that's my name. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait to light this up, but I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm having a hard time letting go of the the wonderlust. Uh, man, really impressive. Um, you stole the wonderlust? I am. Yeah, yeah, I know you'd hang on to that to the last thing. All right. Uh, well, we'll come back uh, to the the final beer, and then we will touch base on the 2019. But we do have a movie, and that brings us to tonight's film, 1995's Glenn and Gary Meet Glenn and Ross, a spicy adult feature film that drips no, with no, homoerotic no, overtones. No, 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 me, no, not. No, me. That's not the movie. <laughs> that drips. That's wrong movie. Don't, wrong movie. Just read your notes. I was starting to feel like Well, they I, both starred Kevin Spacey. <laughs> I was starting to feel like I did the wrong homework. You can see how easy it was for me to get confused. <laughs> Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, uh, 1992, written by acclaimed playwright David Mamet, uh, adapting his, his play, uh, directed by James Foley, uh, who I'm a married man as well, so I've seen some of his recent work. He does the Fifty Shades of Grey movies. Oh, classy. Uh, but, really? but four so years. So he did this, and now he's doing. But you shoots. know what? Where I first came across James Foley, four years after this, he's the one who introduced Marky Mark to cinema with the movie Fear, that thriller with Reese Witherspoon. Oh, okay. That was kind of his. Uh, I thought you were going to say he directed the Calvin Klein commercials. No, that was Kevin Spacey. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Ah, oh, it's such an incestuous oh. loop here. Uh, can we talk about this? So let me ask you a trivia question because I don't know the answer. Okay. We don't fact check. Are all of well, I don't fact check. Yeah. So do neither, all neither do, do all of did all of Mammoth's movies start out as plays? No. Um, like the, American Buffalo was a play. American Buffalo was a play. Uh, one of the ones that I really got a kick out of because it was based in the filmmaking world was State in Maine. Was really uh, okay. fun, fun ride that that was written for the screen. What's the one about um, the con? 
The con job. Uh, um, I'll remember in a minute. I think it's called Glengarry Glen Ross. No, no, <laughs> there's one that's like a it's like a long con, short con movie. I forget the name of it, but it um, it's like an, a, the Spanish Prisoner. I think is what it's called. Oh, Steve Martin. Is it Spanish Prisoner David Mamet? That could have been. I think it was uh, a play, and I think uh, it starred Steve Martin. I think it was adapted yeah. by his play. I think you're right. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, I think the thing about Mammoth that sticks out to me is, so some people have said, is he, like, you know, the the arbiter of toxic masculinity? That's the modern kind of take on his body of work. But I think, it, I think he does it in a way that puts kind of, like, this sp- spotlight on this negative thing. As opposed to glorifying. Oh no, it's a magnifying glass yeah. rather than a spotlight. Uh, well, both, but yeah. it's there. It, he didn't create it. It exists. He's just showing it to you right. in a clever way. What I always took away from Mammoth's work, uh, especially with Glengarry, was after this, the success—not box office success—but this film did really good on HBO and after. On, on stuff yeah, this like was that. like Rounders and those other movies where they did more probably on DVD. They did and really good at the DVD store and on, right. on cable. Right. But what this film did was you had a hundred minutes of a story where mainly everything you got was from the characters talking, as opposed to the traditional way of cinema through action. And that led to a few years later, Quentin Tarantino, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, where he would film these long scenes. Of guys talking, dialogue, and before then it was very taboo. It was like, show when you look at a script, that was always the go-to in screenwriting. If you're looking at a script, and it is four pages of nothing but words, like dialogue, no one's going to sit there. That's a play. That's not a movie. Right. And Mamet kind of broke that taboo with Glengarry Glenn Ross, as far as like with the right director, and I'm going to get to that here in a minute. You can make talking cinematic. You can make with it the right actors, with actors, right and actors but too. but actors are key, obviously. But you've got to have the right director, and uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I also so, want to file that uh, glorification because that might not have been his intent on one of these scenes, but I think that's what's happened to one of these scenes. No, that's the way fans have interpreted it. Right. No, I completely agree. Completely agree. So, can I see that trillium while you're? Uh, yeah. So I, I'm always a big fan of you know when an artist creates a work and puts it out into the into the world. There's always this kind of a debate on what what that piece of art means, and a lot of people will be like, "No, it doesn't mean that because the artist or the actual artist meant this." And I've always been of the frame that it doesn't matter what the artist actually meant. Once art is into the world, it's to the beholder. What the beholder means it is. But doesn't that equate to cigars also? It doesn't matter what your intent was with a cigar. The minute you light it up and smoke it, it's a personal experience. Well, I think they both matter. I mean, they both matter, but yeah. to the guy smoking it, he's not going to... He's not going to be like, well, I'm getting this out of it, but well, I mean, Skip, okay, Skip's okay, intent was this. Well, like, let's say you're a, a hip-hop, a rapper, and, and you make this, this, you know this art that's about your struggle and how you came up and stuff and then you have all these white kids nodding their head to it and and you know live in the suburbs and you know they're supporting the art in terms of financially but i don't know that they completely get what what it is you were trying to do and at the end of the day i don't care i'm still buying my pelvic in me albums (laughs) exactly 100 miles and running tuttle tuttle you know the the (laughs) fear of a tuttle planet (laughs) the the, my I big the reason why the drummer does get wicked. <laughs> you know, one of the things that sticks out to me is, you know, I, I wrote a paper in college about um, way back when. I think this was in 80, no, not 90, 1990 or 1991. UMHB? And it was a comparison. What's that? Was this at UMHB? No, this was, uh, I don't remember where this was. This was, may have been even later than that. Okay. but. Uh, may have been in, in Northwestern, but what I was writing this this the piece about. Uh, when did this movie come out? Ninety two. Yeah, so it must have been ninety three, maybe even, because uh, I was in Chicago at the time. It was Northwestern, so I was writing how Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, uh, how Arthur Miller got kind of red listed, the McCarthyism and all that, based on Death of a Salesman was this anti capitalist piece of work, and how I felt this movie was a big anti-capitalist piece of work and like Tuttle says interestingly 
it's the guys who are big fans of Boiler Room and and those kind of like machismo kind of sales guy movies that that replay the you know the Alec Baldwin scene mm-hmm. that, that they think that that's what this movie is about. But really, that happens like in the first fifteen minutes. Well, um, Boiler Room fans are like Gurkha smokers. <laughs> they really don't. I mean, it. I liked Boiling Room. They Come really on. don't. Ben Affleck. Some of Ben Affleck's best. Ben work. Affleck's speech in that is Alec Complete Baldwin rip-off of light. This. Yeah, it is yeah, so yeah, yeah. not even a comparison, right? Uh, that it, it it's like it's like I'm watching something good. I, I think but what, not really. I think one of the interesting things is kind of like uh, when Reagan co-opted Born in the USA for his <laughs> anthem, <laughs> and then Bruce, yeah. and Bruce was like, "If you listen to the lyrics of the song, it's not really about you." Right. But right. I didn't know that until I was an adult. I mean, I was a child in the Reagan. Those th- those days, and so I was like, born in the USA, <laughs> USA rocks. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't really about. That. Yeah, then, then once I got bitter and old, I'm like, oh, Bruce will say in USA sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it sucks for some people, I think. Tyler, <laughs> uh, if you're the if you're the the, the downtrodden Shelley Levine, the machine Levine uh, guy, if you're Ricky Roma and Alec Baldwin. Life's pretty sweet. Life's pretty sweet. Or if you're like the feckless middle management, uh, like Kevin Spacey, everything's you know gravy. Which I actually think he's one of the weakest performances in this movie. I don't think so at all. I I watching this again, I really couldn't believe the scenery chewing going on, and it wasn't Kevin Spacey. I think it comes down to like remember when we dissected Bone Tomahawk, yeah, and you had the actress in there, and I can't remember her name. I'm sorry, but. She, it's she, not that she was bad. No, it's she, that she was up against powerhouses. Yeah, and that's kind of the way Kevin Spacey. Kevin Spacey. He's holding. Is rel- he hold, no, he hold, you need someone there that can hold their own. He's, he's relatively. I mean, this is pre Kaiser. This is pre Kaiser so say. He's relatively it's, young. It's pre all his this. all his good stuff yeah. for the most part. But um, I do believe this is the first film we feature on the show that was adapted from a Pulitzer Prize winning play. So it's a first for us, boys. Uh, you guys usually don't delve into this. The Yax was Hot Dog the Motion Picture a Pulitzer winning yes, prize? Yes, I believe it was. I thought it might be. Look at Skip making us do grown up movies. I'm so glad Fact Fuck Manicus doesn't show up in this. Uh, Fuck Manicus was up for a Peabody Award. <laughs> um, and then he bit it off and chewed it. And then he bit that Peabody off and spit it out. Uh, well, speaking of uh, fancy watches, sports cars, material things. Did you see this watch? Our, uh, this watch costs more than your car. I thought of you immediately. <laughs> <in> <laughs> RC. Mike demanded that I did that. That I do that line. I. Uh, <laughs> which is which is well, you know what? Maybe I'll get to that later. There there is a paradox there between materialism for materialism's sake and materialism for appreciation of high quality items sake craft watches versus craft watches versus <laughs> Seiko watches Seriously. I suppose I mean uh, it's an $80,000 BMW does that make you a dick <laughs> for paying 80000 for a BMW Kinda. back then not as much as it would now uh, yeah yeah uh, but his opinion of Seiko does not reflect the that's an $80,000 right. no 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 I, I, that's I, I, 80, I drive an $80,000 Jaguar <laughs> okay that says everything we need well of course we're speaking about Alec Baldwin's character who, who starts the movie off uh he starts a late night motivational sales speech given to a bunch of sad sack real estate sales agents uh, by a very young looking and slick Alec Baldwin. Uh, this is him at his kind of right before he peaked. Um, the pathetic sales force of premium properties or premier properties. You know, if you're going to put that much thought into the name. That's almost as original as Essential Consulting LLC. <laughs> what's, the, what's the company that bought Zycar? Oh, shit. Uh, Quality Importers. Quality Importers. Premium Properties. Uh, Deborah, wow. get the lawyer on the phone. Uh, <laughs> Nix the Premium Properties <laughs> LLC he's title. Always, he's always editing me out. But this, this group of sales guys, you've got Ed Harris, Jack Lemon, Alan Arkin, and Al Pacino. I mean, my God, talk about a cast. They're literally slapped across the face by Baldwin's thunderous cock right and left as he preaches his ballsy sales philosophy of ABC, always be closing. He's merciless, he's crude, he gives zero shits about their collective egos or feelings. He was sent in by corporate to announce a new sales contest for the month. And while first place gets a Cadillac Eldorado, second place gets a steak knife set, which he brought, which Skip, that was not artisan. That was not an artisanal steak set. No, that wasn't, yeah. That was straight off the shelf. That was a purely perfunctory prize. That was plastic wrapping. Straight out of the JCPenney catalog. 
I kept waiting for them to show one of those guys with the steak set like. Penny yeah, did not play. Yeah, Stay tuned I'm watching it. Please jump on. <laughs> Um, so it's like uh, rounders where he says, I, I got my knives, I got my plate. Yeah, you just missed the mistake. <laughs> well, everyone else, third place on, guess what? You get a pink slip. You're fired. Thrown out on your tired old asses. Uh, his tools here are fear of them losing their jobs and envy. The guy's constantly referencing his watch, his car. You know, you drove a Hyundai here tonight. You See know? this watch? I made $970,000 last year. I'm here from Mitch and Murray. I'm and Ed like, Harris. From, Ed on Harris, a mission of mercy. Of the alpha male, Ed Harris of the group. Even he's kind of like shrinks shrinks into his suit a little bit and can't really counter that at all. Um, both approaches, fear and envy, kind of seem to work in varying degrees with these guys. They, they shut up and they listen. Uh, it's a scene-chewing, masterfully delivered scene by Baldwin. And it's easy to see why it's quoted over and over and over again. And it was not in the play. They, they wrote this scene because as a film, you need to give these guys immediate motivation, motivation to commit a crime or you got to set them, you got to get a timeline. You got to show urgency. So, urgency. so in plays, like even Greek tragedies where you have the, is it the, the Dukes Ex Machina? Oh, the Dos Machina? Machina yeah, the, where it actually goes in and saves the character. What would be the opposite of that? This is like you put this in there to create the, the dramatic tension, to create the the motivations, to create the... Because the play does that, but it doesn't really translate too well with, without no, it's a Alec slow, Baldwin's character. It's correct. The play is more of a slow burn, more character study without the driving force of these guys need to have that pit of their stomach. You're fired. You have a daughter who's in the hospital. You need... If you're fired, you're fucked. I think Mammon, I don't think the play had that. I think in the play, you go into the play just kind of assuming, oh yeah, this is the the shitty existence of the capitalistic system. We're all in this situation. Um, I don't. I don't. I think that's too deep for the average moviegoer. Also, Very it's, much a, so. it's a different discipline because when playgoers go to their plays, a lot of times they do have the backstory. They'll look at the playbill. The playbill will explain the backstory to it. You don't get that in cinema. You get a trailer and then you're in there. That's true. I did find it kind of ironic, uh, not really working in corporate America for a lot of years. As Baldwin was giving them this thing about how they can change and how they can do that, He's standing underneath a sign that says, salesmen are born, not made. <laughs> it's like you're telling them how to... You call yourself a salesman? I'm telling you how to change, but this giant banner above me says you can't change. <laughs> uh, so that, that was kind of weird. Um, but just like that, he jumps in his BMW and he's gone. That's the one thing I, I saw this movie, I think, years ago. I forgot. That's it for Baldwin. He yeah. never comes back. Uh, it's literally a, just a badass cameo. Well, his job's done. And his job is done, and he, yeah. he's out. Um, Much more effective in the Saturday Night Live skit where he's the... Yeah, I sent Skip the... <laughs> did you guys watch the yes. clip I sent it's, you? The, uh, of course, you never watch anything I send you. He did a recreation of the sales pitch with Santa's elves. He comes in. <laughs> always be always be cobbling. Yeah. <laughs> it's brutal, but it's it's really, really good. Yeah. Uh, well, man, these sales guys are played with masterful strokes by a cast from the heavens. Uh, much like the last film we did here, Heat, uh, the film is stocked high with the best acting-wise. Uh, and you can literally feel, just without them saying anything, the desperation on their faces. Uh, especially older guys like Lemon and Arkin. Like, you can just look at them and feel that their stomach is perpetually I look at, I look at Lemon in this film and I'm like, all right, I'm counting down the minutes till he commits suicide. Uh, it just, he portrays that desperation. It's so, so good. Well. He's either going to kill somebody... Or he's going to commit suicide. And yeah. Pacino got an Oscar nod. That's why I hate the Oscars. I never watch them. Pacino got an Oscar nod for this, and Lemon didn't. Well, what, what I think... Lemon, what the fuck's up with that? And, <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> but uh, This may be, and this is a bold statement, but this may be Jack Lemon's greatest yes. cinematic performance. I think so. I've never, I've never uh, been that much of a student of Lemon, and I, I mean, my appreciation of Lemon came from the old men movies. Right, and so when I saw him in this, I was like, "Holy crap!" Now I understand why people like this guy. Right. Well, one of the what I think is one of the interesting things about it is um, how you have this uh, you have this dynamic that just within this little office, what they've created is this dynamic where you have the bureaucratic middle manager who doesn't really add any value. 
you have the successful guy and he gets the best leads and he gets accelerated to being more successful um, you got the guy who really needs it who's struggling who who just becomes his failure is actually a benefit to the people who succeed so it's not it's not enough where they're all on a, on a team and they're working towards a common goal and some people do better than others through hard work or skill or whatever it's it's it it's this like you know shoots and ladders where the 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 guys who are already successful get the ladder up to the next level and the guys who are struggling get to shoot out in the back and you know one of the interesting things about the whole thing and the more i've watched i've always wanted to know like more about what are these projects they're selling you know what what is this rio rancho what is this they never in the whole course of this movie which is about selling talk about the product that they're selling is it condos is it flat swamp land is it timeshares townhouse what, nothing what is it they don't yeah. get anything but i think that's so the, 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 that, the product becomes almost irrelevant it, but i think that's the whole point of you know pure sales is that you know even baldwin's character said i could take your stuff and i could go out and make fifteen thousand dollars tonight it's not about the product it's just about being able to make that hard sell but isn't that kind of like the more of the commentary on our current system where it's like what what is it modest mouse song about bankrupt on selling you know where it's like you know we're just selling and selling and it's like it doesn't we just got to consume and consume and buy and buy and sell and sell but i think that's really the environment especially in the 80s uh with those people that came up selling in the 80s i just think that that was the lifestyle it was it doesn't matter what you sell it doesn't matter the quality or or whether it's right or wrong to sell it whether even the people that you're selling to can afford it, just always be closing. Close that fucking sell. Right. It's it's shitty. I mean, I'm not gonna you know. Well, that's a downplay. That's that, why I think it's like a horrible. Like if I had a team of salespeople, I would never show this and go, okay. Oh no! I no, hope you no, guys are fired up. Not. There's there's no <laughs> way that, there's no way, and that's one of the things that I, I loved watching watching the movie. Is that it? Really, kind of shows you the transition in sales tactics between the '80s and nowadays. These yeah. tactics won't fly. Your consumers far more smarter than they were back in the day. They're far more attuned to hard sales. They're far more attuned to marketing. The tactics expressed in this movie don't translate to today's tactics. Yeah, like if you called me and said, "Hey, my regional manager's in town for 24 hours." <laughs> yeah, go fuck yourself. I'm, I'm putting a clock on this. It's like, well, then why the fuck am I talking to you? Exactly. Well, I'll tell your regional manager to come see me. Yeah. <laughs> you show up at my house, I'm going to be like, get your ass out the door. <laughs> right. You wouldn't invite them in soaking wet. No, and, uh, I mean like stranger danger. I'm ha- calling. No, it's like, hey, I feel really bad for you, dude, but we're not buying real estate, man. I'm not letting you in that front door. He takes off his Jack Lemon takes off his coat, hangs up his umbrella. <laughs> he literally starts crying. And he's literally well, he's so <laughs> wet you can't tell anyway. And all they're doing is talking about how hot it is outside, but they're all wearing huge trench coats. And just sweating. And then the greatest thing about all that, you feel all that tension through that sale, and you yeah, feel how yeah. desperate he is. And then he gets it, and you go, "Good for you." And then he gets back to the office, and he goes, "Oh, it's that guy. <laughs> he he signs a contract every week." They just like talking to people. <laughs> well, we don't take coffee breaks here on the show. We certainly do love our coffee. You know who else loves coffee? Why our friends Dude. at Drew Estate, of course. At Drew Estate, they have taken the art of blending premium cigars to new heights, slowly infusing the ultra-rich Nicaraguan tobaccos with the finest coffee essences from the fertile, lush mountains of Hinoteca and Monte Galapa. Offering in two varieties, Negra, a dark, rich Maduro broadleaf cigar, and Dulce, a smoother shade grown Connecticut smoke. Tabaca Special is pure tobacco velvet on the palate with a divine aroma. So head on out to your local brick-and-mortar shop or online retailer and pick yourself up some tabacs. You'll be glad you did. Well, there's a line by Ricky Roma, if there's a hell on earth, I won't live in it. And that's always been kind of an admirable mantra of sorts. Live and let live, exist in your own world, own it, and kind of pull the ripcord when uh, it comes... Well, but you notice he wasn't at the Alec Ball... Uh, Correct. He was not at the was at not the Baldwin down speech. By Baldwin's well, I, I'm a skip. If he was in that speech, Baldwin would have left. Maybe with, I don't think maybe Baldwin would have gone to the Golden Balls if Ricky Roma was sitting there. No. I think uh, Roma. Fuck would have. you, <laughs> you fucking cunt. And I'm gonna go along with this. Heat was two years later. I'm pretty sure Pacino just kind of liked what he did in this. It was like, 
you know what? I can use this. Well, he got an, uh, apparently it's a very similar. But you said he got an Oscar for this. A nominee, I believe. Yeah. Oh, so he's like, oh yeah, I'm right. I'm just gonna do this from now on. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. This was the pivot to where, you know, if you look at him through The Godfather and his earlier works, there was a lot of acting there that I really liked, and then all of a sudden he became the one note guy. I don't know. This is where I think he pivoted. I don't know, man. He did do one note for quite a while. You do Attica, Attica, back in Dog Day Afternoon. You're talking 70s, man. But I'm saying he was doing that shtick back then. Oh, yeah, well, maybe there's something to that. Dog Day wasn't this one note. No, I think even that movie where he's the blind guy, he kind of did this, too. Oh, yeah. I can't see! (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Uh, But, I I mean, I think think that speech he gives, you know, if if there's a hell on earth, I'm not living in it. It's kind of the thing you all kind of aspire to. Like, you guys can have all this little bullshit you want, but I choose to kind of do my own thing, which is easy when you're on on a hot streak. But at the same time... He also feeds the negativism, negativism, uh, the the negativism, the pessimism, the doubt. He kind of helps sow that because he knows that the failure of these other guys only helps. It's going to get him success. that Cadillac Eldorado. Yeah, he doesn't. Oh, he co- loves getting under he, Ed Harris's like skin. Like Ed Harris is just constant negative bitching. Very true. And but but <laughs> you know the Roma character, Ricky Roma, he just feeds it. Like, as soon as you start getting a little bit positive, a little bit, you know, hey, I'm going to go out and really do this. Yeah, but come on, this is total bullshit. You know? But that's what's great about that dynamic because <laughs> you really do feel at the end that he likes the machine. Old Shelly, because he actually takes the time to actually, tell me about your sale, tell me about this. And he's listening to him. But I think he's just... I crazy. actually... But I, I thought that was brilliant. I think, he, I think he's just... It's make me acting, make me feel but, better about myself by, no, by telling me more about how big of a loser you are. Like, <laughs> I, I think he's actually like, oh, you made this big sale. How'd you make it? Let me let me pull all the information that you're willing to give me. Because while he's talking to the machine, if you notice, the second machine turns around, he's on that phone making another sale. He's just, I think he's just trying to pick up. It you know, is sales tactics. It is, but I, I mentioned this at the end. I honestly think that was good screenwriting. Because you get the sense that, you know what, he's going to go off to another firm. And he, you kind of, they build it to where you're like, you know what, I'm going to take you, Shelly. You're the machine. I'm bringing you with me. But you know that that can't happen because Shelly yeah. screwed the pooch and It's also a weird dynamic because at that point. So it's like, it's like, it's like pure heartbreak. Like, well, also, not only did Shelly not get the sale, but he committed a crime. And Ricky Roma was going to maybe take him along to hire pastures, but that ain't going to happen either. But Shelly's also nobody Willie, wins. Shelly's also Willie Loman, you know. After he steals the leads and he makes the sales and he gets up on it, you know, he starts filling himself and he starts treating everybody else like shit. shit. Yeah, <laughs> total. He's shit. He's trying to get a little into that too, you know. So yeah, but that's even then when you know we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So you mentioned that the director was super important. I think you do have to have good cinematography and things to to do the framing and to capture the facial expressions. But without the actors. Actors and None of that. everything. What, yeah. what I wanted to go to, a lot of especially adapted plays, but even more so, just dialogue-driven movies, dramas, uh, the director falls into a trap of two shots, close up on you. Like, if we're doing a scene, you and me skip, we're having an important conversation. They're going to film... Kind of like this podcast? Kind of like this. We're going to do a two shot of you and me, and then Tut's going to put the camera over my shoulder at you, and over your shoulder at me, and then he's going to edit that together. Oh yeah, there's a number of scenes here where the guy who's actually talking is out of frame. There's that, yeah. and then there's also a lot of camera movement, slowly moving around to where the camera hits right at that right dot line of dialogue. Right. Or he'll push in on a scene. So do you think right that's the cinematography or the director? That's Both. the director. You think it's the guy framing the shot? The director tells the cinematographer what to do. Well, It's a director's medium. Okay. I mean, I, I understand your classic romantic view of filmmaking, but I don't know that that's true anymore. Well, no, no cinematographer no, is going to... there's going to be a cinematographer going, hey, what about this? What if we, what if we try this? Right, tell him, tell him. And then the director's going to go, that's no, a that's, a, that's a bullshit idea. Can we just get and that then, take? And then five minutes later, it's like, you know what? I had this brilliant idea. <laughs> Let's do this. That's kind of like me and Mike. When Mike goes, hey, why don't we do this? And I'm like, no, dude, we ain't doing that bullshit. And then like four months later, I'm like, hey, he's like, Mike. Mike's like, what? didn't I tell you we were going to do that six months ago? And I'm like... Yeah, but you didn't really describe it well. This is the way it should be done. The director tells the cinematographer. Yeah, like, uh, bringing in more cigars prior to August 8th. No, no. <laughs> do we have a why, bomb why sound effect? Why do you got to bring up? Why do you got to bring up old, old shit? shit. 
No, if, if, the director tells the cinematographer, I want the camera to go from here and I want it to end on him on that line. And I want the light coming in to hit his face. Now, granted, I'll give the cinematographer a little bit of leeway there. That could also be, by the way, the screenwriter in this case. That could be Damon, D Mamet putting those directions into the screenplay. Well, the, the any thing, professional the is, Hollywood is screenplay will cross out those writer instructions. Any director will be like, oh, is that where you want me to put the camera, Mr. Playwright? It's my movie now. I mean, if I was doing an interview, if David Mamet was here, I, I think it would be an interesting question. Oh, I think say, it would be. Where did that come from? But I, th I give the cinematographer on this movie a lot of credit. The blues and, re and, and reds that he uses, like in the phone booths, and in the Mr. Chow, the restaurant, uh, sets a really good vibe compared to the bleakness outside of those places and the office. The office is a very fluorescent lit and just, it's, it's not nearly Well, a lot of that didn't really show up. Every time I've ever seen this before, it's been on VHS or on cable. Right. And this is the first time I've watched oh, it gorgeous. actually digital. The HD is gorgeous. Yeah. And you really see a lot of the crass, craftsmanship in, uh, with the director and the, right. the camera work. Uh, but I, I do give a lot of credit to the director here. I'm making two people talking interesting and cinematic. It's not we're not just filming a play. We're we're moving. We're getting that camera, you know, gliding in and out. Um, with this much talking, I just I really think it needs it. And also, he does film tricks. There's a split screen thing where you see some action on the right, some of the salesmen conspiring the robbery, while you see Jack Lemmon on the left side screen in a phone booth, still trying to get people to let him in their house at 10 o'clock at night, like. It's so bizarre, but it's, I mean, that's, that's shit you can't do on, on, on the stage. And that's why you're doing a movie. You know, a lot of stage stuff, they always say, is you got to perform for the top seats in the, in the crowd. Because you're not, you don't have a director telling you, look at this guy, because this is his moment. Or when he comes in that door, no, you're, you're watching something as big as that window across from us. And you're not being told where to focus. Whereas the director on a film is like, I can tell you what's important here and what to focus on. Okay, so let me ask you about another scene. So everybody talks about the Alec Baldwin scene, but one of the things I really like and that I can respect from an artistry perspective is kind of the syncopation that happens in dialogue where, oh, yeah. people, where people are talking over each uh, other and three where there's multiple rehearsals. things going on at the same time. So the scene where the, the customer comes into the office mm -hmm. And he's trying to get his paperwork back during his rescission period. And then you have Ricky Roma trying to talk to him, you know, basically trying to talk him to, to, to wait so that he could get out of the rescission period. And then you have the, the manager, Kevin Spacey, coming mm -hmm. out at the same time saying, hey, come in here, come mm -hmm. in here. And then he switches over to talking to the customer. And then you get the cop going, you know, well, why, what, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. and there's like four things going on there at once. It's and so it, impressive. It's, it's brilliantly masterful. choreographed. That is, it really all, is. that is all rehearsal. They spent three weeks just getting that timing. And I, I read an interview with Arkin where he was like, especially for these older actors like Lemon and not so much Arkin, he wasn't that old in this, but especially for Lemon, that rehearsal time was crucial because he's not used to Right. And like you said, the guy comes out that door, you're, you got to be on top of it because a lot of those were master shots Yeah, with just one take of everything going on. You can't fuck it up. If you're not ready for Spacey walking out that door, you're, you're you know, you fucked up the scene. And the, the funny thing is, is that I don't think that this was the intention of the director or the, you know, the, the cast even, but that also kind of choreographs into that old eighties hard style cell is that when you have a partner, when you have the pitch man and the close man, there is timing that is developed there to where they feed off of each other. That's when, it's like when Roma pulls the machine what, over Shelley and he tries was to like, help. Yeah, yeah. come over into here, they sync up like with they, that. Like the used car because, salesman exactly, dance. Because they've yeah. done that dance so much. And I don't know whether that was, they tried to capture that sales mentality in that scene, but that's mm -hmm. to me that's what I picked up on. It was masterful acting, and I that I will give credit to the actors because that's all just being aware and. Being I think. Tired. I mean, I think that's an example. Of another one where David Mamet wrote it like that. Oh yeah, because imagine that on. That would have been a key part of. You the, would have to without do that. the Alec Baldwin scene, that becomes the scene of the movie of uh, the play. Correct. When Shelley steps in without a drop and right. picks up that that whole I'm the customer scene and I'm the, you know oh my god it's just. And he, he, and, you know, he's an old guy. He's seen it a million times, and he just jumps right in there. No, he was—he was a French. That was his wife. His wife was French. I, I just right. just slick right yeah. on into it. Did you guys get a kick out of seeing old guys cuss? 
No, it doesn't phase me anymore. It didn't phase me, but like Jack Lemmon dropping like cocksucker and fuck this, like I, I just really liked it. One of the <laughs> one of the first, but when I when I came off the road and started as a graphic designer, they I started out in Colleen, Texas. They moved me to Waco, Texas, because they just bought out this this company, and the principal for the company was this old like seventy two year old guy, and he was like all these guys. He was f bomb this, you fucking cocksucker. I have never seen that kind of language out of a grown man in a professional setting since. But that was just the way. That's the way it was. I mean, it, well, it's you know, really weird. What? So people, a lot of people compare this to Boiler Room or compare it to those kinds of movies. I compare it more to kind of like Barry Levinson's uh, Ten Men, where they're in the That's diner. Right. Where, yeah. where they're in the diner and they all sell like aluminum siding. Have you seen that? I've seen Barry Levinson's Diner. Uh, maybe I'm mixing two things. What's the movie Ten Men, where they all sell aluminum siding? Oh, I don't, no. I don't His know. His first movie was Diner. I think it's called Ten Men, or maybe it is Diner. Where do they sell aluminum no, siding? No, it's like a coming of age. Well, I was thinking I don't like remember the that. Ten Men was like the juror movie with a. Uh, uh, well, there is Stewart. a movie where a bunch of guys sell aluminum siding, and I think it's Barry Levinson. And maybe I'm confusing a couple of different things mm-hmm. here, but th- it's very similar to that where you have this kind of, you know, Willie Loman kind of death of a salesman kind of vibe going at the same time as like this trapped in the American system to, you know, I mean, you're selling fucking aluminum siding. That makes sense. That's very Levinson environment. Yeah. I mean, he did a lot of the... I'll have to look yeah, that it, up. It was a uh, 10 men. Uh, uh, was it 10 men? Uh, yeah, no. uh, with uh, Dreyfus and DeVito. Yeah, yeah. And Dreyfus and DeVito have a very similar kind of um, um, kind of inter interplay that that um, Roma and uh, Shelley have in in this movie in Lemon. Um, it's just as as a film fan or as a fan of acting, it's just you just sit back and just like man, they don't make, they don't make them like this anymore. Actors, I don't think. Well, I don't know if they don't make actors like this anymore. I don't think that they make vehicles like this anymore. Uh, um, I, I think mean, I think they do. We just don't maybe get a chance to see them. I mean, there's a lot of well, I indie mean, stuff. But I mean, as far, but as far as yeah, like, I was about to say. I mean, think back to Bone Tomahawk. I mean, that whole movie was just spectacular. Right. In terms but again, of it was old. But again, character. it was old. Kurt it, Russell yeah, and older yeah. actors who yeah, right. have been through the system and are pros, like. But and also with that one, especially Bone Tomahawk, the the writer for it was he wrote Western, Western novel. Again, it was written. And so by he the, yeah. he understood what he needed to get for that scene, and he, lucky enough that he got yeah. actors and everyone else that could just make it click. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna stick because I mean, I, if you if you actually you know, just take the the concept of Bone Tomahawk and just say it out loud, someone's gonna look at you and go, well, that that's just ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean, we keep bringing up a uh, boiler room or whatever. To me, that's just this light. I mean, it was just the the Ben Affleck scene is a, clearly a Alec Baldwin type scene. We're like, oh, this scene is going to be the talked about. I watched it again. It's it's weak. Well, I'll make it's a really weak. I'll make a prediction. So, you know how we did the the Fonda's Twelve Angry Men, and then it got Twelve re- Angry Men. That was the juror. Thing. It got yeah. redone. Um, my guess is is that at some point some independent filmmaker will remake Glenn Glarig and Ross and with a new kind of generation of actors um, and Indie. it'll be interesting to see if they're able to pull it off Indie films, yes, and they probably will be able to pull it off, not to the extent with, you know, working with actors like these guys, but it'll, it'll be out there, it'll be just kind of like music though, you have to go search for that because the stuff that you don't have to search for is going to be Marvel movies. You know, just the, the comic book, big media blockbuster stuff. The independent stuff will still be out there. So let me ask you this. Who would you cast in this movie if you were making this movie today? Oh, because God. in the new play, uh, Al Pacino played... The Jack Lemmon role. The Jack Lemmon role. Which, is, which I, like, like you said, Tuttle, I would I'd love, I'd to, love see to see that. I'd love to see that, yeah. But if this was a modern day movie, I mean, who would you put into... I mean, would DiCaprio be in it? Would that's who they would? Yeah, Matt yeah. Damon. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, DiCaprio basically just did his with Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, that was that still played within all these same movies that take upon you know Boiler Room. This okay. Who does the Jack Lemmon character best today? 
All right. Well, you're looking at a now early 60s. Uh, who are you going to get? Bruce Willis? <laughs> you might. Bruce Alec Willis, Baldwin? Bruce Willis would be a great uh, Ed Harris, Ed Harris character. He would. But pretty much you get the same thing Ed yeah. Harris did. Only Bruce Willis would just clearly not want to be there and not give a shit. Uh, man, that's a good question. And, and I have trouble, you know, from a younger group. Because, I mean... These guys look, they're probably in their early 40s, but they all look in their late 40s, early 50s. What about like a Jeff Bridges? Yeah, but he's late 60s. Yeah, but it could be the same thing. But again, we're talking about old actors. Like, as far as like a, a young... Uh, I mean... That's the, that's the point. Well, I mean, are, are you going to try and get someone that you would equate with, you know, like with Lemon? The lovable loser kind well, of. Well, would, who would, would you get, a, you know, someone who's known for doing comedy or. Because, I mean, a lot of those guys, I mean, they do transition. They do Zach go Galifianakis do. as Shelly um, the Machine. I mean, like the, the, the Arkin character, maybe uh, Steve. Um, Carol from The Office? Or? Uh, no, no. Um, no. What's, what's the guy's. Yeah, from The Office. Steve Carroll? I think you, they would probably go that route. Yeah. Um, for the for the spacey the the hard nosed office manager they'd probably go to like Jared Leto or some uh, some no Jared Leto's Roma uh, they would put Jared Leto as Roma oh he doesn't have the chops for Roma I don't know who has the balls for Roma out of the young Roma would be um, what's the guy's name the uh, Bane the guy that guy's was in name? the new Blade Runner oh, Gyllenhaal Gosling no, no Gosling. Gosling Gosling I was thinking Tom Hardy. Bane, he's got a little bit of swagger to him. Tom Hardy would Tom be Hardy. great. He'd be Tom Hardy, yeah. they, or the guy that played the the, the, Wink, the, the Winklevoss twins in the Facebook movie. That guy's a dick. That. You could get the Winklevoss twins. <laughs> uh, well, Lemon, Harris, and Arkin, they're all throughout the film stressing their balls off about losing their jobs and their lack of good leads from the office manager. Uh, again, played by Kevin Spacey, who we're probably never realistically never going to see again in a, in a film um, speaking of which sorry um, I just watched the movie where they replaced him post yeah the production. Mark Wahlberg movies about the yeah. ransom yeah the, the, the guy that played uh, Christopher Plummer Christopher Plummer was perfect in that role well he was like, originally he, I, I he, can't even imagine Kevin Spacey in that movie yeah he lost he had the role and they at the last minute they switched it over I to Kevin Spacey I can't even Spacey. imagine Kevin Spacey in that role I, I could see going nuts with it and, and bring in like, you know, a, an actor that's not known for anything like it, but, you know, like maybe in the in the Jack Lemon mode, bringing in like a Jim Carrey or a, a comedic kind of that can play sad. I go I go nuts with it. Go unconventional with it. Jim Carrey's a good call. That would be... They, 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 well, like I said, if you, you're going to be a comedian, I mean, you look at Will Ferrell. He's tried to do some serious stuff. Yeah, keep him away from this. Well, no, uh, because no, because if it works, because remember when Robin Williams first went serious, everybody thought that that was a joke, and then they were like, going, "Holy shit, yeah, he's good." That's where I was going with Carrie. I, th- I think he could maybe play the Shelley role. I think Farrell could. Uh, as he did well. Andy Kaufman, Andy Kaufman role. Yeah, the number twenty-three was pretty serious. He was hardcore serious. Yeah, that was a really good movie, underrated movie. So, are we going to move on to the next beer? Yes. And the next cigar? Yes. You can always finish that cigar at some other point, but I'm lighting up the Neanderthal KFG. I will, oh, I will curb, I will curb this. the The 2019 is uh, started off really ballsy from the get go. Like Danny said, I think maybe the Vitola just that that much at the beginning, and it's sure enough, it's tapered down to, um, but man, really tasty, very, yeah. It perfectly paired with that. I mean. I'm not saying I'm a I'm great at pairing beers, but I'm pretty great at pairing beers. You're three for you're three for three, my friend. You're this next one, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, we, let's get a stout glass. The the little short ones. Um, this next one is a perfect pairing: the what? Neanderthal KFG and the 1050 barrel age. What y'all just pour in my? Uh, that was the the trillion. That's more the of the pot kettle, yeah. 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 Um, they make one called PM Dawn, by the way, that is outstanding. And they make one called Affogato, which is a kind of a milk stout, coffee milk stout, which is hmm. great. I did notice, I, uh, I, I know you're friends with these guys at Trillium, but they kind of ripped off of the Ahe artwork <laughs> right. on, on, the, uh, on the can. It's so craft. Um, oh, give me a 
me. I had to do it. Um, okay, so now we are going to be drinking the... 1050. 1050. 1050. Barrel aged. The, it's an imperial stout. Oscar. Aged in uh, bourbon barrels. This is one of those breweries that was hardcore craft brewery that's gotten bigger and spread out, become more commercialized, but still they're making some great craft beer. Uh, what we, was the... What did we do, Oscar, the other day? Our, um, we did two of them. Um, I think it was the Old Chub. And oh, the old. We did the. Uh, we had one of the one they they. What was dedicated. the second one? We do Death by Coconut a lot here. Nope. We do. We looked. Um, we, we, that was the one we tried to get. We was tried it? to get. It was out of season. Uh, but we did. Um, Their coffee porter is called um, in the green green and black can. We do that. We drink that one a lot. And we did old. We did the old chub for Death Wish. Yes. And we had we had four of their limited release IPA that they dedicated to a fireman, a local fireman that had died. Tut said it was the best beer we ever had on the show. Uh, speaking of IPA, it's, it's one of my it was, top five beers. It was the Trillium, one of the best IPAs. Trillium we've and done. Treehouse are making some of the best IPAs. Um, uh, the Good Night. The Good Night. Good Night. From oh Oscar God, Bass. it was good. And I will say this: uh, while we have mixed success with cigar companies as far as sharing our reviews and promoting the show when we feature their stuff the 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 beer scene has been a very hard nut to crack and oscar is one of those companies that shares socially relevant puts us out there um you know they, they've got a huge reach on instagram and they they put our pictures out there so well the founder is a great guy and i'm sure he'll get a kick out of our craft discussion if he ever watches this you know there's a it's a really really old school craft brewery in california called 21st amendment brewing and uh they're featured along with oscar blues in um sierra nevada and a couple of others in a in a, a documentary called crafted in america have you guys seen that no it's a really really good uh documentary on craft beer in my opinion um but i saw that and then we we actually went to the Great American Beer Fest, and I ma made a point to go try to meet him, and he actually wasn't there, but the guy that was there, I was like, hey, man, I'm a huge fan. We actually make a cigar called the EC21. It's based on Prohibition, kind of like 21st Amendment, and he's like, oh, well, that's cool. He goes, every Friday or whatever, we get together out in the lawn, and like 10 of us smoke cigars together. I said, well, I'm going to send you a box of cigars. He wrote a handwritten note back, you know, basically saying, hey, thank you for the gift. Um, they, these were excellent cigars um, you know I had written I had kind of told the guy hey I, you know I really we've really tried to adopt to this idea of the concept of craft and and that's really a, a lot of what of what we're about and, and he had never as even though he's a craft founding member of the craft beer world he never thought of cigars that way and then he goes you know I can absolutely see what you're talking about in terms of the concept of craft and, and, and what you do and the simplicity of the labels oh, that's cool. and the in the quality of the product and this is a guy who's out there buying twenty dollar, fifteen, twenty dollar premium cigars in California. Sure. And, you know, this is a brand he never heard of. And now we get notes from him all the time like, Hey, do you think you know, you guys looking for anything, you know, we'll send you a case, <laughs> you know, if you could send us a, a box of cigars and um, it's just become a, one of those things, but to, to take one of these guys that's recognized as one of the founding members of craft beer and then have him kind of recognize kind of the craft in, in our product yeah. is has been pretty cool. That's very cool. Um, the cigar you're lighting up? This is the KFG. Uh, it's based on the, I can't pronounce it, it's, it's the grotto. The G stands for grotto. It's basically the cave where they discovered the, the Neanderthal remains. Uh, okay. Not too far from... Uh, Rhine, um, Westfallen, where the Schusters are based. Um, the, the Neanderthal, the basis of the Neanderthal is actually in Germany, um, whereas the basis of Cro-Magnon is really France. Um, we, we're actually thinking about doing another brand based on, <clears throat> well, I can't say it unless someone steal my trademark. Of course. But, um, <laughs> kind of based on the Visigoth mm, kind okay. of uh, history, the, the Germanic tribes. Um, you know, just going further down that 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 uh, kind of path of you know subcultures of you know yeah. crude men. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is the 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 way to do it. But um, 
yeah this is a great this is kind of like the, the emh size of the neanderthal it's not a figurado like the hn but it smokes great and it, it gives us a lot of room to put tobacco and we use a little bit more of the pennsylvania double ahero the green river sucker one in this and um this one sneaks up on you like you know they talk about ninja cigars where you're like oh this is uh, this is nice yeah and then you, you're sitting here drinking down a uh what is this a uh 12.8 12.8 we're back That's up all? there in the decent range <laughs> i tell you skip I'm a if little, you're not uh, drunk in the next 20 minutes we're pulling out goliath i'm um you look at i and uh goliath my training tokyo black and uh my training maybe we'll finish off with a jake uh, uncle jacobs and tweak drink that beer kate i i'm beer. expecting a handshake from skip at the end of the night and being like you know what kate you did it you did it buddy uh boy so how uh ring gauge wise this is a 56 56 the neanderthal at its largest the core line neanderthal at its largest is a the bulbous part is about a 58 okay so it go we call it a 52 58 or 52 56 the actual foot of is about 56 the bulbous part is a 58 the small part at the mouth is about a 52 okay so this is a four and three quarter by 56 but you were saying this gives you by the consistent 56 it gives you a little more leeway to play with the tobacco yeah um yeah we make this in like six and a half seven inch by 56 molds so it gives us a lot of room in that meaty middle to um cut out this and the flat head gives us the ability to cut deeper into the the bunch I think out of uh, the the three cigars we smoked up to this point, uh, just upon ignition, this is the most Roma, to me, the most instantly identifiable Roma cigar we've we've had. I yeah, mean, if you retro held this thing, man, you you're gonna <laughs> you're feeling it, and then you start drinking this stout, it's like drinking an oil can. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm getting horny. I'm getting excited. Uh, no, oh, it, it definitely. Well, I mean, the the Weaselito was, you know, like. I like the H-Town with St. Lancero, and it was... Always be quaffing. Was that, always be quaffing. Uh, is that a Q? A-B-Q? It's Q, a quaff. Quaff, is, quaff yes, Q. Uh, queef is a Q. <laughs> always be queefing. I think we found our opening quote. <laughs> always be queefing. It's good, Mark. And there goes our two females. Always viewers. be quaffing. I think quaffing is I will better. go with quaffing. Um, but no, this, uh, this is definitely the most Roma of the thing. I, I got to say, I curbed it just so I could follow your pairings. Um, the 2019 man was just delicious. Well, you can uh, smoke them at the same time, and it gives you a, I think a good uh, kind of comparing. Well, first of all, it makes you look like a little bit of a degenerate. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say I'm like one of those guys with the blending. 72 on episodes Instagram. into I'm our smoking pack. two cigars. Uh, I got my hands in the leaves. 72 episodes into though, our podcast. I thought the same thing when I opened when I because we just took these out the humidor, like you said, it was the first time we smoked them. When I when I did a a pre light draw, I I could smell the factory like of the, I, of the Nika Sueno. like I I could taste like it, it has its own. You know, I've been in a few factories, but Nika Sueno has its like this. I love when I smoke aroma yeah. cigar that upon ignition I know I'm smoking aroma cigar and I get this is the first one. Well, with the Weaselito I got it, but the obviously the Wonderlust and and that was a totally different. Animal. This one I lit up and I'm like I'm smoking aroma craft. This is a lot of cigar, man. I mean, you know, I smoke constantly, and this cigar, if I don't take my time with it, I'll get nicotine okay. sweats. Sweats, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, interesting kind of, you know, we've kind of covered a lot of the movie, but kind of going back to Danny the Le the Machine uh -huh. Vasquez. Um, you got a nickname now. <laughs> um, so Danny recently took his first trip to our factory and blended his first cigar. And you know, I mean, you're working with good materials. It's not gonna be completely bad. Uh, his second attempt was a little bit better, but um, maybe Danny can tell you a little bit about kind of the process that we go through. I, I would say the biggest kind of characteristic is we blend from the inside out, meaning we blend from the filler level to, to a great cigar that consists of just the filler and then we figure out what wrapper to put on to complement it with the the right. binder and the wrapper. Yeah, I mean it just speaks to to the to the level of knowledge that Skip and Esteban have, right? I mean it's if you want to cook something, I think this is kind of what what Skip was bringing up when when he was kind of schooling me. Um, is you know you can't throw, you can't know what 
you can't not know what something tastes like, right? And, and throw it into a recipe, right? You can't be like, uh, I like mushrooms and carrots and I don't know what this is. And I'm just going to throw it in and you just threw strawberries into something, right? right. And, and because it's going to completely fuck up the, the flavor profile. So to sit there in a, in a schooling with the, the, the tobacco that they use at Nika Sueño and not know the super, uh, not super know the characteristics of it to be able to just go ahead and blend something is kind of where a lot of guys, there's a disconnect there. They think it's just that easy, right? Well, I know broadleaf is good and I know that uh, Indonesian binder is good. And, and so if we throw all that shit together, should we, and it's like, dude, it, it doesn't necessarily work that way. And one of the things that Skip was, was also kind of compared it to was, was music, right? It was high notes and, and bass notes. and. Uh, you can't have too many bass notes because then it sounds like shit. You can't have too many high notes because there's a balance there. And I think that uh, one of the things that well, uh, we, Roma, they do at the factory so well is that balance of flavors regardless of strength level. Because um, there could, to make a strong cigar is simple, is really easy, right? But to have that well balanced cigar where you want to continue to smoke it even though you have the cigar sweats or the nicotine sweats right, right. Um, that's that's where the music is is beautiful right so um, you know there for a week and, and smoking leaf by leaf by leaf and then taking these notes um, I mean I, I literally just I got tired of smoking I was just like I mean, at one I point Danny's like hey um, are we gonna go eat yeah no <laughs> oh, shit yeah, yeah absolutely I'm like no I'm, it's like, so where's well, that Gringo can I get some, Can I get some um, Coca-Cola or something? Like, yeah. he had, like, you know, five Lajeros, like, four That's... or five Visos, a couple of Secos, yeah. and they're all going at once. I'm like, well, what about that one? How does it compare to that one? But what see, about that's... that one? How does it compare to that one? And he's, like, you know, hitting it, and all of a sudden, he's like, whoa. It's like you got to back up off. Red Bull. You know? <laughs> and, and I will That's say that. one of the things that I, I really appreciate, though, in my learning, though, is, uh, like, we went to the Jose Blanco seminar where he was doing like all the rappers and stuff but then we went to the james brown seminar where it was like this is la Hero. this is what it tastes like well different there was the there was actual regional and I've, ne- and I've never had it i've never had components broken down like that to where i'm actually tasting the components not the final product right. and i love that kind of learning that expanded my eyes so much it's a weird thing because i kind of translate it a little bit to craft beer as well to where, yeah, you can throw grapefruit, you can throw coriander in there. That's fine, but can you make a German pilsner? Can you make a German lager? What's well, like mean, a, when you when you, you make, go to a restaurant and you say, "I want to be a chef," they go, "Okay, make me an omelet." Right. Make, make <laughs> me. Can you make that basic? Do you have the understanding of the basic component to what this is? You can branch off on that. I mean, you can throw all kinds of spices into your distillery, into your brewery, and that's fine, but. Do you have the fundamentals that really make great beer? So we were watching. There's this Vox piece. <clears throat> I think if you if you Google uh, hip hop rhyme schemes or hip hop rhyming and Vox, like uh, from the Vox uh, populace, the the blog. Right. There's this there's this chick that seems like a total kind of hipster, you know, whatever young white girl and she's doing this kind of breakdown on the t- the rhyme schemes of different rappers through history and you know you could take a song like uh hypnotize from from notorious big and you go man i love that song it's so cool but when you start actually breaking down the the breaks across the the the, the bar the the internal and out uh, external rhymes when you start talking about this rhyme scheme, kind of another rhyme scheme, start, starts in the middle of that yeah, rhyme scheme. I know what you're saying. And, and at the same time, it's so subliminal, you don't really catch the 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 artistry. That, I mean, some people who do that do it so obviously that it's apparent. But when you're listening to a song, go, man, this song kicks it. It's got a great beat, and the rhyme's great, the story's great. And then when you realize that the, one of the reasons why you really appreciate it is this underlying kind of subliminal kind of uh tech that happens in the in the in the rhyme schemes like rakim and 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 nas and and eminem and you look at these guys right and you and you go holy shit like they breaking it out with colors and and different things um that's when you go wow man 
I, I I knew there was another level to this that made me appreciate it. I just wasn't in tune enough to understand what that level was. Yeah. That's the way I, that I kind of approach tobacco is, that's why I think you can smoke our cigars again and again and again without really getting tired of them because you go smoke other stuff and you come back to it and you go, man, I forgot how good this is. You don't really understand the level of technique that's happening underneath sublimity in the in the in the blend scheme but but you can appreciate it even though even if you don't understand exactly how that is happening but if you want to recreate it if you want to match what we're doing you have to understand that underlying rhyme scheme and do it in a way that doesn't come across so obvious and that's craft right that's when i can just you know drop the mic and step back and go, holy shit, what we just created was great. We did it in a way where we can create it again and again and again. And we have the mechanisms to do that, the quality control to do that. You can put any name that you want on your product, but this is what it is. What it is. And by the way, it's two to three dollars cheaper than anybody who's even approaching this level of the game. So, which it, yeah, and that should be mentioned. I mean, price points have gone hog wild over the last year. Um, yeah, we got a price increase coming in July first, and it's like three to five percent, which means like you know six bucks on a box. And I feel kind of like I just feel bad about it, but it is what it is. Well, that says something, but you, I mean that's so got, nominal. But at, at the same time, you're not it, you're not living in a bubble. That's a price crease that's happening all over the industry as well. Right, right. We run into that, you know, with casual fans. They'll be like, oh, man, I can't believe this has gone up. And I'm like, yeah, but you have to look at the industry at the whole. That when your base component goes up, you have to pass that along. It's not just these guys doing it. It's everybody that's doing it. It is. And I think, Skip, you just coined a new term, subliminy. Sub subliminy. Yeah, I'm gonna start using that. Subliminization. I don't get what your guys' podcast Crap is. Words. Well, it's Crap words. subliminy. <laughs> you, you get it eventually. Just keep listening. It's subliminy. Uh, boy, yeah, I I found myself slowing down on the cigar. The the first three. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm giving this one a little bit of uh, a long leash, um, but it is pairing beautifully with the 1050. KFG ain't nothing to fuck with. It really isn't. Uh, and this will only be, as for now, this is a European? Yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, and I think the majority of it gets sold back to U.S. consumers, but um, this may be... This is a little too much for most European cigar smokers. I, I am curious. There is one cigar you guys, I believe, this year, uh, if not early this year, late last year, put out. The 20 Anos, Anos from Schuster, the yeah, Connecticut. Yeah. I'm... Uh, that cigar just looks beautifully photographed. The burn line on that thing, it just looks golden and shiny and gorgeous. Well, I mean, um, it's a lot harder to make milder, nuanced cigars, particularly with yes. Nicaraguan tobacco. And it and, looks like such a different thing from you guys. And to make a shape like that, that that's constructed that high quality. It's a beautiful looking cigar. I can't tell you how many hours I spent at the table watching every single aspect of the the bunch the break the selection of the tobacco the and that cigar is like seven bucks you're seven euros it's the only cigar i was hoping we'd smoke tonight but yeah uh, i think we have some of those just but. cross it off the list <laughs> uh you want to talk about a f- that's an ipa cigar by the way i'm an ipa guy i'm an ipa guy that's a yellow rose or a um rose of shine uh, What's the new treehouse? The juicy, the one that tastes like orange? Uh, that is like that. I will say this: there's a, a brewery we did last episode here in Austin, Fourth Tap Room Co-op. It's a co-op brewery. Uh, robot IPA. They do a robot IPA. Kung Fu robot. Uh, it's an American IPA, which confounded us because there's right. literally it's... no hops or bitterness, but it's a, a it's a grapefruit heavy, which I don't like grapefruit, but I love that beer. It's a delicious beer. I'll give them a little a little shout out there. Danny's a Danny's our resident expert on fruity uh, beers. Oh, you would do the yeah. uh, Kung Fu Robot IPA. It's delicious. The wild cherry chocolate yeah. from the brewery and the yeah, <laughs> and chocolate and the cherries. You came to Great American Beer Fest with us, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Danny's like an and you know all the big fat guys with the, the beer oil, oiled up beards and everything are in the stout lines, and Danny's over in the in the line with the 
I'm looking know, for Zima with the chick. I was looking for Zimas. We did a Zima episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we uh, and so they brought it back. Me, they, tell me about the Cellus strawberry. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I just got word from our friend Rev Java. They've released Zima again this week. It was supposed to be a one-time thing, but they, I guess it's going to be a yearly thing. We're not doing it again. Uh, we claim responsibility. We claim that we brought back Zima. Well, it was a damn good episode. Dude, I remember, hey, that was our knuckle dragger episode. I remember going to the bar and saying, can I have a a, a, a Zima with a shot of... Uh, 151? No, it was like Contro or... Contro. Quantro. Con- Quantro. Quantro. Some kind of uh, sangria kind of shot that you'd put in there and... You order a couple of bottles of James for the ladies. The doctor and I would get a double big gulp from 7-Eleven. Two Zimas, <laughs> the rest with 151 rum. Two straws. Stir it up. <laughs> well, you know, BFFs. Ride uh, or die. Ride or die. That's before I knew about the doctor's questionable uh, activities. Uh, well, let's finish this movie. When all is said and done in this film, no, office, officer manager Kevin Spacey realizes in a surprise twist... The robbery, they did rob the office for those valuable leads. It was old Jack Lemon, because we we thought it was going to be Adam Arkin, because Ed Harris was telling him, hey, you better do it, because I've told you I'm thinking about it, and even if you don't do it, you heard me out. It's like the most bullshit It is, but Arkin's such a meeky guy. But there was also the side deal where Kevin Spacey was going to sell them to the machine. There was that twist where it could have been Spacey stole his own leads. It could have been anything. Am I the only one here that thought maybe... Baldwin came back and stole them. <laughs> my, my theory was the leads never existed. They were fake to begin with. They're just with. recipes. And then let's say you somehow got a sale off of those leads. They'd know it was you. They'd know it was you. And they knew, Baldwin knew that you went the extra length and you're his new number one guy. That's the whole moral of the story because the guy who actually stole the leads would have gotten reward for it. For, be, for being... That could have gone that way. Yeah. I, I got the feeling that Mitch and Murray would have rewarded that. You know what? I can't believe they ever called the cops, to be, to be honest. Yeah. And Spacey had two opportunities here to help out Lemon. He offered him X amount of dollars and a percentage of his profits to give him the leads. And then when he got busted for stealing the leads, he was like, hey, I'll give you... I got... What was it? Some measly amount, like six grand for the leads? Like No, he got 2500 oh, That's right. Ed Harris got the bulk of it. Right. What a piddly little like that's nothing to commit robbery for to commit a two grand. For 20, yeah, yeah, you know whatever. At the end of the day, <laughs> it does seem even for ninety two. I know the dollar has changed. At the end of the day, it does seem very piddly shit. Whoever, whoever violated the norms of society to move ahead would have gotten rewarded for it. I that would have liked to see them, Mitch and whoever, come out at the end. Because th- when, 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 you when you hear, make America great again, what they're really saying is, make, Glar- make America Glen Gary Glen Ross again. Uh, I was waiting for you to bring that's it. A, that's a much longer acronym, I think. but It is. But if you just take the G, make, make, make America Glen Gary Glen Ross again. We are big supporters on the podcast of Stormy Daniels' Make America Horny Again. <laughs> we do our part every two weeks, but... I don't know. Stormy Daniels just doesn't do it for me, but it's a belly tattoo. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> not that I've watched any of her. For it research, it I watched. doesn't seem. I watched like, for research. I, not not that I want to get off track, but it doesn't seem like it seems like uh, the side piece should, should be a lot less expensive than one hundred thirty grand a pop, right? Like you, you at th- that level, yes. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you start buying virgins from oil oh, sheiks or something. <laughs> Correct. Oh, he's probably done that. <laughs> Isn't he married to one? <laughs> uh, that was too soon. Yeah. The opinions of the too first lady did not reflect. I apparently no, they, haven't had the benefit of essential consulting, so. Uh, <laughs> she, she, yeah, but I mean, if you're at a golf tournament and you've, well, I guess he doesn't drink or smoke, which already puts him under the. By know. the way, uh, Don Jr. now dating uh, one of the Fox News. Con- uh, oh, the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The f- Fox Five. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta give it to him. He brings down the big game. He's the big game hunter. <laughs> Bigger the wallet, hotter the chick. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, she's something. I mean, he has five kids with his ex wife, Danny, not for nothing. And she did a Latin king before him. Did you see that? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The wild, wild world of politics. Yeah. 
Well, we're certainly it not. makes no, Nicaragua no, no, seem. No, no. <laughs> Makes Nicaragua seem tame. No, he's yeah. wholesome. I saw him go into a church with a Bible under his deal, and that's why he got elected. I mean, come on. Well, oh, we don't want to piss off the Latin kings. I want to make that very clear. <laughs> TNCC is pro Latin kings. Uh, we love those guys. Do the, I'm sure they smoke Roma Craft cigars. I don't know. So, any Crips watching or Bloods, you heard what he said. You just <laughs> we're pro those guys too. We yeah. love we love all illegal underground street gangs. Oh, now they're illegal immigrants instantly just because... I didn't say immigrants, I said illegal street gangs. What is that gang? The El Salvadorian... The MS-13 or whatever? Yeah, I MS-13. Was Mexican. I thought MS-13 was a, was a legal Nevada. I don't know. I was born in America. No, that's UF-13. MF? No, no, that's a... Uh, yeah. I thought that was the North Is that all out kings? UF-13. <laughs> all out Latin kings? <laughs> we did do a uh, we did do a thing at a cigar shop, and we it was when Norteño first came out. That's a great cigar. Oh, we love it. It's love one of our favorites. Cigar. And uh, we we're, it just came out, and we were, we went into their humidor, and we're like, "Hey, uh, you guys gonna get the Norteño?" And the owner was like, "No, gang affiliation. We'll never have the Norteño." We're like, oh, that's true. That's true. Is it true? Yeah, the big uh, La Raza kind of Mexican Norteño thing. Yeah, but whatever. Norteños, Norteños are also people who are from the northern part of Nicaragua. Okay. It is my favorite, right now, my favorite. That's like uh, my favorite new thing is people sending me questions like, is the Fable logo the same as the, the pedophilia logo? It's like, <laughs> yes. I'm yes, like, it is. Yeah, yeah, except that one has seven sides and one has five sides, and they're both triangles. Is one it of true them, that Hillary Clinton smoked a Fable after going to the pizza parlor yeah. to molest those kids? Is yeah, it true, Skip? Exactly. And I'm like... <laughs> First of all, it's not my brand, but, but no. Uh, yeah, what's that all about? I don't know, man. People, I think, and you know, this is one of the the characteristics of this business that it's so small and so competitive, and there's so many people who are in this business that don't have any business in this business, and so many people that are in this business that are struggling because they don't they don't kind of understand one side or the other of it that. You know, there's all these little kind of backbiting, you know, stabbing people in the back. And um, I imagine the same thing happens probably in the craft beer business, I would imagine. But Well, it's the exact reason I got out of the independent film world. Yeah, it happens in every one of those it's, environments, I guess. It's soul-sucking, and it's like, you know what, we're all kind of trying to do the same thing here. Uh, I mean, the whole idea that we're all any, just... To spend any energy... Uh, you know what, I could be creating or I could be shitting on the other guy at the end of the day that's what it is it's like i'm just going to focus on my own thing but the the idea that that i'm friends with every single guy just because he smokes cigars it's like no there's a lot of pe- there's a lot of this tight community and camaraderie in the cigar world um that exists but there's a yeah, lot of losers good. that kind of penetrate the wire and kind of somehow integrate themselves in that situation okay well real quick before we finish but, the movie then let me let me call you out for a second, Skip, and be this. You, Here we go. somebody <laughs> posted the views of a. K do not reflect the shoes night cigar club. <laughs> Quit saying that. I there's no sh- I, I'll answer any question. I don't care. Somebody posted <laughs> a negative review of Roma Craft. I think it was a Google review or a Yelp review or some ridiculous avenue for what you do. And you posted a thing on on Facebook, and it was like, look, I'm not your best friend. I'm not your counselor. I'm not your, you know, BFF here. I make cigars. And if something I say on social media rubs you the wrong way or whatnot, that's not on me. That's on you. I'm just doing what I do, and the views on my page are mine. If you get hurt by that, so what? But that by no means should lead you to get on... I think it was Google or something. Well, well, I think you're mixing two things. One, I just want to say that Skip that hurt me very, very much. <laughs> well, first of all, Tuttle, don't like get if, drunk if you, and leave bad if, Yelp if reviews. You say, if you say to me, "Hey, Skip, um, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out here. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I don't really smoke your cigars. They're not my cup of tea. Uh, you know, I think that you know they're not well made. They use shitty tobacco. I'm like, okay, you know." I, I get that you say that it's not your cup of tea from a taste perspective, but let's just assume you know the very first thing about tobacco. None of this other stuff you're saying is true, right? This was him from, coming at you from personal... Well, it came at us from a, we use intentionally cheap tobacco, 
in order to make more profit. And, yeah, I think and, it's, but I think his quote was something like, you know what, Skip said he doesn't need my money. So. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't need anyone's money. I mean, I don't need Romacraft money. Um, Can I have my $20 back? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I feel, like what I, I, th I feel like we make something and we sell it for a fair price. If you buy it, you're entitled to your opinion. If you actually physically go and spend 8 $9 for one of our cigars, you've purchased your your kind of right to have an franchise opinion. to have an opinion whether it's good or not it, you can either you can go on Yelp you can go on Google whatever you can say I didn't like the cigar uh, it didn't burn right it, it didn't meet my expectations or whatever but when you start getting into the, the depths of cigar making and you start making proclamations like we use short filler we use yeah. we use uh, cheaper tobacco we use it's like first of all you don't know what the first fucking thing about what you're talking about but second of all Everything you just said is demonstrably untrue. I can prove to you through invoices, through uh, expert testimony. You know, if we were in the UK, I could fucking sue you for slander because nothing you just said is actually true. That's one of the things that I... I can't argue with your opinion. But what a, I, actually, but I actually struggle with it in our reviews is that, you know, when I get a cigar that I don't like, I have to be very careful because... There's so much variance in palettes to where what's in my wheelhouse isn't what's in your wheelhouse, isn't what's in Cade's wheelhouse. So when I say, you know, this cigar's cheap, it sucks, it's it's horrible, that's almost character assassination because I'm well aware enough of the process to where I know that that's not true. I know that the, there are a lot of cigars that I don't like that a lot of craft went into it. Well, I can take a cigar, but, I can take a cigar apart. I mean, I've been doing this long enough where... I can take a cigar apart, and I can tell you whether it was made well, whether See, that's, that's the, the objective things. That's, I can tell you if it was, if it was made that, with good tobacco. You know, regardless of what people think of us, I'm not expert enough to where I can smoke and say they paid fifty cents on this and they're upscaling it to seven fifty. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm not that much of an expert on it. Well, um, as, yeah. As so, well, so my point is, is like there's there's the reviews that are like guys who are like, hey, I didn't like it, and then a lot of those guys, I'll just approach them like, hey, thanks for sharing your opinion. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? What is it you do like? Maybe maybe it just wasn't conditioned well after you know you you after we shipped it. Right. You know, let me see what I can do. To, to, you know, I don't need you to come on. I'm not trying to convince you to love our product. But I also don't like that you put your eight dollars down and you didn't have a good experience. Yeah. Your retail tobacconist should have already taken care of this, and I'm going to intervene and and get your retail tobacconist to take care of it, and then I'm going to take care of it on the back end with your tobacconist. Um, That's one because of the, the tricky things is that the business is so approachable from a consumer level. There's not many businesses that you can, as a consumer, converse with the head of a, of a company. I can't watch Glengarry Glenn Ross and Facebook James Foley, the director, and be like, you know what? You fucked up that scene, man. Actually, you can, you but he's moved, probably not going to respond. You should have moved the camera some are at this respond. point to capture that, and you didn't. You suck. I think that's part of it, like especially when it becomes a like a personal attack. The availability right? of you right. guys is so. I think what it is. I mean, the Romacraft has these fans, right? That I've kind of discovered because I, you know, I was in my own world for years where I didn't, I wasn't truly paying attention to everything Roman was doing. So I've kind of noticed these fans that have this expectation or this uh, feeling of they're entitled to Skip being their their friend, right? Their yeah. their best friend. So if Skip doesn't by na you know nature just become their best friend again i'm so sorry i yeah. keep coming I mean, back so here. there has been a couple of those guys like um i buy 600 dollars worth of cigars a, a week or a month or whatever and therefore when you came out with a cigar i should have been entitled to one it's like well the world doesn't work that way no it doesn't i, I make so many cigars we sell them we, as fairly as we can um the retailer decides to put them into a sampler or they decide to sell them to their best customers or they decide to mark them up. You as a consumer get to decide whether you like that behavior or you don't. But, but don't blame me. But even more All so, I did was make a product even that you more, want. Even more so to what Danny's saying, though. It's like you're in this unique position to where a guy in his backyard lights up a cigar, has a few drinks, and decides this isn't doing it for me. And I can let the fucker know, sitting in that factory, and probably within 10 minutes... If it's late, you're going to respond. 
he knows well, that, and there's there's a there's a there's a there's a juice there. There's a troll juice there that like he's looking for Skip to come on there and say something to him, and he's anticipating what you're gonna what you're gonna say, and right. really nothing you can say is gonna be the right thing. Well, but here's the thing. Most of the time when I respond, I'm not trying to change the mind of the guy who's already decided that he's sideways with us or with me or whatever. I'm really trying to contain the contagion so that that doesn't spread Spread. to other people. No, and that that makes sense. Like, for example, uh, this week, uh, Gabby Caffey, who I don't know very well, but he seems to be a really smart guy. You know, he, he owns all or a piece of a little factory in Honduras. I think he's trying to do the right things. It's a struggle because this business is just very competitive and tough. His recent tact has been, look at all this commotion going on in Nicaragua. Oh, I know the post. The reason why this is happening is because watch this Cigar Authority episode where they talk about how Nicaragua is the cheapest... Why don't you shut up? The cheapest possible labor. He's basically telling you guys to shut up. Basically, he's saying we pay our employees $135 a month and the reason why there's all these struggles is because we treat them like slave labor. Why don't you keep your mouth shut? And you were like, that's easy to say for Miami. Uh, is that the, well, is that's this, a different guy. That's a different guy. Okay. My, my, <laughs> at, my, thing like is, my thing is, I'm not trying to change it's your mind. To with all I'm not trying drama. to change your mind. Because if you really believe this is true, then A, you're informed, and B, you're, you're opinionated, so whatever. But just so everybody else there out there doesn't think that this is true, the reality is, is that our employees make better money than most doctors and lawyers and teachers in Nicaragua, number one. Number two, we probably, I, don't, I can't speak to what every other factory does. I know AJ and the Placencias and Drew Estate and a number of other factories take really good care of their people in a lot of ways beyond just salary. Benefits. But when you start adding on seventh day, 13th month, Aguinaldo, indemnization, when you start adding on all these things, are they making U.S. comparable wages? By far, no. Are they doing as well as people in Honduras and Dominican? Relatively, I would say probably yes. Some factories, they're probably doing better. But when you're trying to say, hey, buy Honduran cigars, because there's probably going to be a, a boycott on Nicaragua, and oh, they that, treat their people like slave that labor. That's his angle? Es- essentially. Yeah. And he's continued to do it. And I'm like, I can't stop you from being a fucking... Either you believe this, which means you're an idiot because you're wrong, and you you don't want to know the truth because I've told you the truth. I've offered to have him come into our factory and look at our books and look at exactly how much we've paid in salary and benefits compared to how many cigars we make and how many people we have and extrapolate how much people make per month and then compare that to any people who work in any other industry in SLE. But he won't do that because it's much easier to sit in his, his fucking chair and wherever the fuck he lives, um, you know, paying you know non undocumented immigrants to build his new cinder block fucking office, and then talk about how we uh, basically take advantage of of our people in Nicaragua. Is, On the flip side, I'll tell you, we've only ever had something like seventy three employees, seventy five employees. Uh, 78 employees out of 67 employees, meaning like nine people in six years no longer work for us. That is an extremely exceptional retention rate. And you can go talk to those nine people. I'm not even talking about talk to the 67 people that work for us. Talk to the nine people who don't work for us. Skip left bad Yelp reviews on those employees. No. Talk to those nine people about how it was working for us. All those nine people, not a, only two of the nine even work in the cigar business anymore. One is in Spain, uh, one is a preacher, one is a mother who married a guy in Managua and had to move. You talk to those people about how their experience was working for us versus working for other people that they've worked for in the last 15, 20 years, and I'll stand by that. So, you know, talk your bullshit somewhere else. I don't know what your angle is, if it's to sell Honduran cigars. You know, it goes back to this industry. I don't understand. I mean, it, it. sounds like self-preservation. It does, sounds like self-promotion. Does the open book policy is that open to me too? Of course, because I'm want, coming down there you with a whole it. swag bag of <laughs> fuck you, and I'm getting all your fucking cigars. Yeah. I'm sorry. I had to. I, I'm only one more time into the into the. I know he should have ate a second plate of barbecue. But yeah, so um, you know, 
this 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 is kind of a lighthearted discussion. It's kind of what well, it is, but I, I did want to address the availability of you guys because it is like Tut said, it is unique to the industry. Some some stay a good distance away and only respond to positive stuff. Some don't respond to anything. Uh, some only kind of uh, make their appearances. It's such a diverse industry, and it's such a kind of we've seen it all over the last couple of years interviewing everyone from you know guys like you who at the factory who've done all to guys who just put their names on a cigar to you know and i didn't name names no I, so I'm the just, next time, no i'm just sorry i, I remember a distinct interview it was like i got the best name I got the best name. <laughs> this cigar is going to kill because I've got the best name. Right, it, it right. Was, was the next time the you're name. sitting down with John Drew, who is a guy who I really respect in the business, even though he is a little bit crazy, he has probably one of the biggest hearts of anybody I've ever met in, in the business. Agreed. You sit down with John Drew and you say, Hey, John, Gabby Caffey says you guys play, pay slave labor wages, and that's why they're revolting in the streets and that there's about to be a boycott and uh, people should buy Honduran cigars because, you know, Nicaraguan cigar makers should just treat their people like shit. Mm -hmm. And John Drew will talk for three hours about the shit that they've done to transform Oscar Benavidez. I mean, uh, um, not Oscar Benavidez, the, the Oscar Gamez, the neighborhood that they moved into. They used to be fucking gang ridden. Um, that they've done in the community, what they do for single mothers, what they do from from and helping kind of one-off kind of cases that come up, the things they do from a work uh, quality, uh, life life work balance. Um, I hate to say this, but when when Public Enemy released "Can't Trust It," they had they slammed on Nike, saying the neighborhoods are struggling. We like your product. Put some money in it. <laughs> right. That's basically what you're saying that John Drew and you guys are doing in Nicaragua to where you're putting money into an investment. Well, let me put it this way. Danny works for us. Um, and I don't expect Danny to go with me on the panel to go into this long diatribe about working here. But I can tell you there's no other business that I know of that has six employees that has full health care benefits, family medical leave paid, vacation policies that we have. The flexibility of the hours you work, the quality of the environment you work in, the the focus on ma maturing you as a as a as a person, taking your weaknesses and trying to focus on those weaknesses to make you a stronger part of the team. I mean, right. I'm not saying we're the employer of the year, but I'm saying the same things that we do here. The what you know, if Danny comes to me and says, "Hey, you know, there's a situation. What do you think we should do?" The answer immediately out of my mouth every time is. This is what I would want someone to do for me. This is the right thing to do. Let's figure out how to do that without fucking up the business. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's exactly the same answer I would give to someone in Nicaragua. To bring it back to the movie, I think that that was the exact failure of that office in the movie is that there was a total lack of leadership from, you know, the Spacey character. Or from he, Mitch and Murray. Or from Mitch and Murray. Well, the culture, it starts, the, the it culture starts, it starts at Mitch right. and Murray, the culture. Yeah, I mean, if I was running that office, first of all, I would have a better understanding of what the fuck it is we're selling and why people want to buy it. <laughs> I, if I'm buying it's leads... It's a picture of Flamingo Skip. Yeah. If I was buying leads, they would all be the Glengarry leads. Um, I would be focused on Ricky Roma saying, hey, it's great that you're a great salesman. We need guys like that, but I need you to help the guy who's struggling. So, and Danny, so he doesn't give you the shit leads? He doesn't give you <laughs> the... Uh, the Rio Roma. The Rio Roma. I would be like, part of your kind of goal this month is I'm tying your performance to how well this guy does. Let me and, help you. And you got to help him get out of his rut because he's a great. He was a great before. Yeah. He has the skill set. We can't take a guy who's been with us who has this much experience and lose that. There's a certain customer set that needs a guy like Shelly Levine. And you know, there's a certain customer set that needs a guy like Ricky Roma, but you got to help him get over yeah. whatever his mental block is. That's called leadership. I would take the Ed Harris character and say, "Hey, motherfucker, you're fired. Stop talking about the negative shit. You're not getting a Cadillac. You're not getting knives. You're getting a pink slip because all you're you fired. do, is, all you do, is bring negative shit to the office. Well, you're getting a Xanax and another chance. 
Right. Calm down. <laughs> and but no, there's it, a lot of things you would do from an organizational culture in that Well, there business. are. There are. And, it, and I think it goes back to on the break a couple breaks ago. I was talking to Skip about when I got out of college, I was desperately looking for a job. And I went to... Uh, oop. Oh. I, this is extremely. I, you can ask Brian McGee. This is an extremely rare beer. I'll give him. All right. I uh, I started working at Circuit City Sales, and there were those lifetime sales guys, sixty mid sixties, been working retail electronic sales their whole lives. They were Shelly, and I didn't get. I know I'm I'm twenty one walking in here, and there was the young hotshot, the Ricky Roma Todd. <laughs> uh, who I quickly became friends with because Fuck you, I respected what he did, but we all had a purpose. When that customer walked in the door at Circuit City, if they were, if it was, they parked their RV outside and they were looking for a TV VCR combo, I was their guy. They're not going to bother Todd with that sale, but they're walking in looking for a, a brand new home computer and all this. That's what Todd's there for. But there were these Shelley characters, these older guys trying to sell. Refrigerators. I worked at a car dealership with a guy like Shelly Levine, yeah. And I saw them outside smoking cigarettes, just sweating every day. Hey, uh, I'm off tomorrow. But if this guy comes back that walked out on the sale, remember, be sure and give them my name because I talked to him. Right. And it was. I, I just read this recent article about um, about car dealerships and how these old family car dealerships are consolidating and selling to the, the big cigar. I mean, uh, car groups. And you know the whole entire kind of the access to information, what the actual invoices are, access to information about the cars has completely turned the car dealership model on its head. Amazon Prime is not selling car, you know, uh, cars yet. yet. Um, and you've got this regulatory kind of situation where they're protecting dealers from people like Tesla. But the 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 old model of the the hey, you know, what do you want your car payment to be? You know what you want your interest rate, how much you get for your trade. You know the triangulating you through that whole mm -hmm. thing. Then let me talk to my manager, circle mm -hmm. the final price. That whole shtick is out the window. A guy calls and says, "Hey, I want to buy a Ford F one fifty. I want to buy this VIN number that's on your lot. I want to pay five hundred dollars over invoice. If you don't want me to, I'll go to this other Ford dealership." Literally, Skip. This week we're going tomorrow. It's funny you say that. I got an email from Ford sales manager. We see that you're a Ford truck, you're equity in your F-150. It's never going to be more valuable than what you have right now. Bring it in. Tell me what you want. It was the most straightforward. You don't have to deal with the sale. Basically, don't worry about the salesman. Right. Tell me what you want. Tell me what the payment you want. Boom. I can get you out of here in an hour. You're one of the Glengarry leads. I am one <laughs> of the Glengarry leads. You got a good credit score? Boom. Financing, because <laughs> then they're trying to make money you on on the the, the extended warranty, the rollover, on, and on and the maintenance, the... And you know they want to build a, lo a relationship with you where you're getting your oil changes with them and all that. So th this whole kind of world that existed in the late '80s that's depicted in this movie, that world doesn't exist anymore. It really doesn't. No. And there's a lot of, <clears throat> and, and it doesn't exist in the cigar business anymore. You can put a fancy name on your shit. You can make up a fancy story. You can, um, you know, say I only sell to brick and mortar people. You can, you know, tell this guy, hey, I'll sell it only to you and fuck the other two guys in town. There's all these tricks you can do, but at the end of the day, consumers have way too many options. And at the end of the day, it's it's a luxury product. I'm going to consume it. I'm going to buy it at the best possible price from a guy who gives me the best relationship. Uh, my next question is for Danny. We're talking about all this. As someone who's very active in the cigar groups on social media, um, do you? I have noticed a kind of backlash against some of the bullshit as far as, hey, we got this limited release. Uh, you know, it's going to be gone tomorrow. Buy it, buy it, buy it. It's got You've a. Got, it's got a. I'm only in town for one hour. It's very Shelly style email marketing. <laughs> if you don't buy it, it's going to be sold out in 24 hours. Create a sense of urgency. Uh, and it, this, for a while there, it worked. But all of a sudden, I've seen in my group, Cats, and then in, in other groups, that eh, a couple eyebrows get raised. And it's like, well, this shit isn't really being what we're promised sales-wise. 
is this kind of ties into the movie i mean are those kind of sales tactics do they have a shelf life are are are, are consumers kind of like you know what man i can pay 60 bucks for a five pack of these i'm, I'm promised all these flavors and all this 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 great this great stuff but you know what i'm not are you talking about us here? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm not yeah, because I can tell you, A, there's never been anything like that we've released that didn't sell I'm bad. not naming <laughs> names. And B, I've never had anybody come and back honestly, and go, this is total And garbage. honestly, it's not, it's not one company that's yeah. doing it. There's a lot yeah. of companies that do this. So th- the, there is a shelf life. There's, it's one time, right? Like you got one time to fuck everyone in a social media group because it spreads. The, the one time you, you've screwed anyone or you've kind of bullshitted your way, you got you got one shot to do it, and maybe if it's not even a good bullshit, you won't even finish that one time, right? Are so we talking about hashtag copycraft? Copycraft. So, I think actually this is not copycraft. <laughs> uh, it's more on the retailer side. I, and on, honestly, this is not Viaje at all. I wasn't even talking. Well, yeah. Well, you said that. Not me. <laughs> What's beef, Kate? <laughs> beef is when you need. Some gats to go to sleep. Is that, <laughs> yeah. is that okay? Are you? Are we talking about <laughs> rap lyrics now? Yeah. I, I just I've I've noticed that you know what with the rise of the Facebook, especially Facebook mm-hmm. uh, cigar groups, boy, you can you can do the hard sell and it will work, but there's a turning point yeah. to where for the prices they're demanding right. and the things they're promising, when that doesn't. So you mean from a retailer or from a manufacturer side? Manufacturer side. That, yeah, when that yeah, doesn't sure. deliver, right, right, right. there, boy, that social media backlash can blow up in your face. No, no, yeah, absolutely, and and it will, and it it'll only, I mean, and I, I've I've instantly thought of a couple cigars, but I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna get into it. But cigars <laughs> that the pre-release was yeah, so I was trying, high. Trying to get, yeah, yeah, the pre-release was so high demand, and the pre-release was so like, is the you know second coming of. Jesus, whatever with, with you're going to taste Hostess Twinkies in this thing. Absolutely, and it's and the the thing is, is because those pre-release were put in people's hands that were fans that it doesn't matter what you tell them, they're going to blow it up, right? And then all of a sudden, the full release comes out, and it was it blows out, and then all of a sudden, you can find it everywhere. It's on the shelves. It's not moving. It's more expensive than they said it would be, and and. All of a sudden, it's it's just gone away, and no one gives a shit about it anymore. And then you'll see someone post a picture like, "Hey, I'm smoking this." Like, dude, really? Like, but how does that guy get away with doing that again? And again, the, and well, again, that's and what again. I'm saying. The that's shelf crazy. life, the shelf life, typically w- would be that one time. Or, you know, if you've had a bunch of successes, and then you can have that one that one time fuck up, um, you, you might be able to get away with it again. But I think that's the beauty of kind of what we do and, and Skip saying, you know, the open book. It's like, you know, we don't have that gimmicky thing. No, and it's a huge so, it's a huge plus. Right. It's like, hey man, we're doing what we do. Right. It's gonna be the same thing next year as it is now. Right. If you like we're if you like what we're smoking now, it's gonna taste relatively the same a year from now. Uh, I I just man, I just see it time and time again, these guys come out with yeah, but yeah. what's even worse than that are the guys that scoop those up, and then they turn around and you know oh. they're basically scalpers, right? Yeah, but you know what? I think I've seen a lot of decline in that. When a big cigar that's mm-hmm. been hyped up and they buy them up and then they're like, "All right, uh, fiver for you know twenty percent up on MSRP or whatever," I see a lot of guys saying, "Fuck you." No, yeah, and and, it happened, and it's there's a transition of guys that have been on the in these groups for a long time, right? And then there's these newer cigar smokers that are also relatively new to cigar a little naive, groups. A little naivety right? there. Yeah, so they're, oh, yeah, you know, I got to get that blank. Whatever. I want to get a picture with 50 likes. I got to get the hot smoke in my hand. Right, and then it's 50 just like likes. 50, 50 likes. Come on, man, that's, that's a plate. Man, it's <laughs> peanut. That's I, I know. I, I, we, we, we deal in tri- triple digits on the TNCC. TNCC stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, no, I, I just think it's uh, it's – it's marketing, and it's it's. Hey, man, you got you got to do what you got to do. But even like we we saw a, w- a little while ago, someone was secondary market a black Irish and a Wanderlust, and it was like one hundred twenty dollars for both. Cigars. What I love, what I love is when we have that kind of demand for something, right. and then 
people go out and and then we figure out try to how to help i mean i post a list of people who are going to be getting in i post you know hey every time someone a retailer posts hey i got this thing where you can get one i try to post that and share it but here's the thing what i love is when people get them and they go man this cigar had all this buzz it had all this whatever <laughs> But I gotta admit, it's fucking good. <laughs> That's what I love. Well, no, I love seeing the post. You know, Black Irish, fifty bucks or whatever. And then Tut, I would never to, pay. I would never pay fifty. Tut bucks. goes to Havana House in Austin. They're like, hey, I got a. He sends me a picture. They got a box of them. Uh, okay, grab me a couple. I'll 11, do a review. <laughs> Eleven bucks. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Eleven yeah. bucks or whatever. I'm like, if, if you pay more, if you pay more than fifteen dollars for any cigar we make, um, you've overpaid, and. I, I, I can see the wonder lost and some that of the... That was actually overs- one of the first things that I learned from you. Uh, we were sitting, I think at Havana House or somewhere. You were actually like... You had a chance to be really cool. Like We, we were sitting in a, the south of France at this <laughs> lounge. Anybody that knows me knows that you're saying anyway. Knows our listeners I'm know not he doesn't. Gonna be it's the more, south, you're more south likely to say we were, we were sitting in... Yeah, Bucky's. Ar- 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 <laughs> Arby's. <laughs> right. <laughs> You made the comment, and it was it was just off the cuff, and you were actually working on the plans for HQ. It was before HQ was actually, you know, something. We came over here. I mean, there was still, like, two-by-four studs. And I kept telling here. you, like, this is going to be like this. And yeah, this is yeah, yeah. Be you like were this. like, look at this. This is going to be this way, and this is going to be this way. And I'm right. like, this is a bunch of drywall and two-by-fours. Right, right, right. But you made the comment, I, I'm, I, why pay more than $15 for a cigar? And this is when I was first smoking the Roma Craft brand, and that really kind of opened my eyes. I was like, "Holy shit! I'm getting this kind of value on this price point." Yeah, why do that? I mean, I said it today. Now, there there it, have it, been a couple of cigars to where I'm like, "I mean, look, I that's a great Mike and I cigar. bought a ten count box of cigars for five thousand uh, dollars. The the Davidoff Oro Blanco. Look at this watch. And let me tell you, Are those next get they're so good. <laughs> they're so good. What are we pairing those with? <laughs> champagne. <laughs> I'm Re- not champagne and regret forget that not a champagne yeah. <laughs> I am so, a big fan of regret but I can tell you it's a great cigar is it worth 500 probably not but I mean definitely not there's no cigar in the world worth 500 but the the thing about it is is when you're smoking one cigar a week the difference between a $9 cigar and a $25 cigar is not really that great I mean you can go see you can go see um a shitty movie with popcorn and drinks and it costs you 40 bucks so if you can sit sit down and watch a football game and, and it costs you 25 bucks to we smoke. make that's that's actually one of the things that Cade brings up to me because all the time like a couple of the reps for uh black works and uh black label they they kind of joke they're kind of like oh what's tuttle gonna think about this because he's always hard on the price oh ben, ben and uh, and uh yeah and i'm like well hey and, and you're gonna go Kate, to a pub and spend you know, on three pints over two hours, you're going to spend 18 bucks. But you're going to bitch about a cigar over two hours that costs the same. Well, you know, I think if the cigar delivers and it's really good, it does. You're not going to de- yeah. you're not going to bitch as much. And it's had- more when it's not great and you go, ah, it was pretty good. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But fuck, dude, it was 15 bucks. And there are honestly some cigars that we've had on the show, some pricey cigars that you can taste the intent. You can taste. The Naka Tamale, the the Saka Naka Tamale. That's a good example. It's a gr- that cigar is what sixteen dollars. About yeah. I have three boxes of them. I love that you cigar. You can taste the blender's intent. But here's what I know, and I and I know the story behind it, how it was blended, One farm, all and that, I completely yeah. respect it, and I pay for it because I respect that, and right. I and, and I say this prefacing with peace and love. And Danny can tell you, we bought like six boxes of it. That said, I know. That the extra coffins are a bullshit addition to the expense. He I Saka know, says it. Right. So I'm like, why can't you just make the cigar in bundles and sell it to me for eight bucks? He does what he does. Right. And it's like a musician releasing a thing in a, in a, in a But, it, but Saka's decorative... like, fuck you. If you want it, buy it. That's, yes, I love that. Right. That's, that's one of the beautiful things about Saka's marketing is that he was like, oh, it's a bullshit expense? Yeah, it is. I Here, swallow it that's and you, what it you is. pay it. Right. And, but, and, and I did. But that and Naka, I, that and Naka, I, have, I own a cigar factory, and I bought six boxes. That, of that. Naka Tamale, I could taste the intent of the blender, and I got right. it. And I think I think that kind of leads into why you know. But interesting thing, by the way. Sorry to inter- interrupt you. You bet. There you know. By the way, 
um, Two Guys Smoke Shop has, and I say this as a longtime friend of Steve Saka, mm-hmm. two, 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 two Guys Smoke Shop has a cigar called the Firecracker. Mm-hmm. And this year, Saka's making one, mm-hmm. and we're making one. Mm-hmm. It's the same wrapper, same size, two, two different Trademark. factories, made by brothers. So Esteban, who works with me, and Raul uh, Diesel, who works with Saka. Wait, well, two guys is releasing your Firecracker and Saka's? In the same year. Well, Probably months apart. Oh, that's new. So here's the thing. This is the. I'm not trying to hype this up like Don King, mm-hmm. but only I've, in America. But I think I may be the only. Per, there's only like. Three, Can I light the Roman candles. There's only like three people. There's me. Uh, I don't think Saka has smoked our version. He may have smoked our old version. It's just pretty the same. But so let's say Saka, me, Esteban, Raul, Anthony, uh, Esteban's son, Raul's nephew. Mm-hmm. We've all smoked it, mm-hmm. and we all have a verdict on which one's the best. Same size, mm-hmm. s- essentially the same wrapper, mm-hmm. from the same source, mm-hmm. made for the same store at the same time. Uh-huh. That's the ultimate face-off. It is the ultimate. I'm not trying to hype it. <laughs> you hyped it. I'm hyping it a little bit. Okay. I'm telling you, you should, you should buy some and smoke them side by side. At the end of the day, what it boils down to is they're both really good cigars. It just, they're completely different. Well, speaking of cigars, I can't help but notice I burned your ass on, nice. the, on the Neanderthal. Nice. He talks a lot more than you. Nice. Come on, Danny. Help me out here. So, so I was, at the end of, but I was going to. At the, what al- I was, always be closing. I, always be closing. Always be today. closing. What, what I w- do want to say before we close out this movie was we get a lot of comments on our end of the year top ten list because there are a lot of repeating names. And I know you have a, uh, you you've kind of pointed out in top ten list, you know, hey man, a lot of these consent, you know, we're included in the half wheel consensus. There's a lot of companies nobody's talking about it anymore. That was that was very big at the time or whatever. Well, a lot of blogs focus on things that are new to them. Correct, because that's what we want to smoke something that's going to get us listeners because it's it's new on the shelf, and right? If we can, but we do get a lot of people saying, you know, there's a very consistent pattern here of Saka cigars getting in your top five skip cigars in your top five and I just kind of go back to is like when you're a seasoned cigar smoker and you've been smoking for a long time you can't help but recognize blenders whose palate is similar to yours yeah if Skip likes a cigar or if Saka likes a cigar and my palate happens to be kind of in sync with you guys I'm probably going to like that cigar the difference is our cigar is about three dollars cheaper, so a little bit. No offense to Saka, but we bit. should we should win the edge out on that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, the coffin is a beautiful presentation. Well, we we've, we've gone on some different tangents. I, I tried to close this out a while ago, and we we drifted <laughs> off. Uh, but basically, by the end of the film, it was old Jack Lemon who, despite him closing that morning on an eighty thousand dollar deal, the machine is back. Uh, it was him who got talked into robbing the office by Ed Harris and stealing the precious leads. You felt so good for the guy and then crash. Turns out the suckers he sold to weren't suckers at all, but mentally deranged people who just like talking to salesmen and signing deals that they can't possibly live up to. Uh, but he doesn't know that, so he starts talking shit to Spacey. I'll go anywhere. I'm back. The Fuck machine you. is back. Fuck you. You know who's bad at your job? You, you fucking So fuck all up. of a sudden, the one good guy you kind of liked is an asshole. And you don't feel it all for him anymore. Uh, that moment where Spacey calls out Lemon and he gets tears in his eyes, but my daughter. I don't like you. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I'll give Skip some. Spacey nails that. But my daughter. She's in that hospital. You know what? I don't like you. It's heartbreak. It's America, man. It's heartbreaking because it kind of the one guy is, I kind man. of felt for turns out to be a thief and an asshole. That's America all wrapped up in about it, 110 minutes. It really is. It's not death of a salesman. It's death of a cocksucking goddamn salesman. I mean, Mamet really hammers home. They're all assholes. Well, no, we, there's no good guys. When we were talking about this movie, we were debating whether doing falling down or doing Correct. this. And we said, well, this is kind of falling down... Uh, has a baby with death of a salesman. <laughs> it really is. Uh, well, 
Pacino has a line here. It's not a world of men. It's a world of clock watchers, bureaucrats, office holders. It's a fucked up world with no adventure to it. We're the members of a dying breed, he tells Shelley. And at that moment when he tells Shelley Which that, was. you get the feeling, as I said earlier, that he probably is going to go elsewhere and you maybe would take Shelley with him. He showed some warmth here. Shelly's going to be a greeter at Walmart. Let's Big be honest. Time. He is. <laughs> and he's got to fuck that up, too. And he's going to be telling the great stories about the good old days. But this just proves that everybody at the end of this thing, there's no good guys. Everybody is fucked up. There absolutely is no redeemable traits in any of these assholes. The end. Well, it's like the line Ugh. from Death of a Salesman where he says, You know, one time I was great. You know, before, there was a time in my life, at one point, I was great. I don't know if any of these characters can point to that moment. I don't know if any of these characters can point to that moment. But in their mind, at some point they were there, you know. Just Actually, because, Lemon points just because to they it won all the, the time. Just he because they like won the El Dorado. Eight, eight months, top of the sales board. Yeah, yeah but you know what? Lemon has a sick daughter in a hospital and you're kind of rooting for him. But then, not only does he rob the place, but he's shoving it in Spacey's face. Fuck you, asshole. I'm the king of the... He gets that cocky thing. You're because like, then he works in a system where, twofold, where, A, it rewards the guy who does that. And then on the flip side, it gives... It rewards the guy who projects the, the greatest, you know, shadow of that. And... Um, I think you're right. I think what he's trying to do is he's just trying to play into that upper echelon of the system. And If Alec Baldwin is getting flown in here to do a speech to be a dickhead, then I'm going to be a dickhead and prove I can be the, a bigger dickhead than the young hotshot that was a dickhead here earlier. I mean, by If that's what you like, Baldwin, I can do bald. I can be a dickhead. Yeah. I, I think there is something to that, but at the end, he's a thief. I mean, we didn't get into the context of Donald Trump, and, and nor do I want to, but... In a lot of ways, Donald Trump is a product of this era, and of you know who, the guy who you know takes the fast track, and 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 the guy who bullies and uses the uses his his kind of position to accelerate to the next position, and all of his failures become not important. It's really more just this brand you build, and. Um, I'm really kind of. I don't miss this America. I don't miss this not, don't, late no. late eighties capital, capitalism. And it's it's a really good slice of life, cinematically good slice of life, of a subset of society. High pressure cold calls that I don't know if that exists anymore. Probably a, to a limited it does. extent. It does. It, it does. But uh, we haven't seen it quite done like this before. So uh, I'm actually really glad, Skip, you picked this movie. Uh, it's not something I would have probably revisited on my own. Tuttle uh, hadn't even seen it before, right? No, no, and it actually hit me at a perfect time in my career. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that once the cameras are off. Uh, Skip, I begged you to take them out and yeah. talk about this beforehand. Uh, but no, but it, also it led to, like I said, Pulp Fiction and a lot of dialogue-heavy, really cool movies that didn't have to have high action, high drama scenes they could just have dudes talking guys talking but if you're gonna have if you're gonna have like a netflix and 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 chill kind of weekend with your bros this is definitely a great movie to have in there it really is um and and for for 100 minutes for an hour and 40 it goes by so fast right it really doesn't seem like a 100 minute movie i mean it flies by yeah and it's a great opportunity for you to kind of like look at your own kind of situation and go yeah you think you're miserable look at these assholes <laughs> well there's that and there's the wait I don't want I, you know I'm headed down this road I don't want to be on this road I don't want to be the corporate yeah you know kind of Holy cubicle shit, rat I need and, to have options <laughs> right yeah options are but there's a lot to be nice. said for, for doing something you really believe in and um, that way when Alec Baldwin comes in and swings his brass balls at me I can go fuck you you <laughs> fucking cunt <laughs> what's your fucking name well you own your own business you be the one with the balls yeah true just put a little romocraft in the on them I think everybody loves the idea of having their own business but uh, until they actually do until they actually do it's a it's a whole you know making making a 
fifteen thousand dollar, twenty thousand dollar payroll every Friday is uh, a bitch. Well, it's a lot of responsibility. Oh God, I'm, I'm so sad. Of, <laughs> so it's a lot of God, it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, all right. Well, let's sum things up here uh, for my two business owner partners who are crying in their fucking beers. Uh, Cody's like, "Fuck you." Uh, the first beer, Firestone, a winner. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, the second one, the Stone, was really good. That chocolate presence. I think Skip did a really good job pairing everything tonight. Uh, stone was stone was my favorite. I like the trillium. Night. I really like the trillium. That uh, the oatmeal really uh, subtle, but it, it was really really good. And then ten fifty was, man, I had to have something to keep up with that Neanderthal. And it you really, killed it. I did. I did. You killed it. Um, as far as cigars, I'm going to give. And if we were if we were to give you a, a breathalyzer right now, you would probably. Be oh, good, I'm good not to driving walk home. anywhere. Tonight. No, I'm saying you'd be good to walk. Oh, home. Oh, I would. Last time you weren't even good to walk home. Last time I wasn't good to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I pissed like, I pissed like a flamethrower. Uh, no, it was a good show. Uh, I will say as far as cigars go, uh, the Weaselito, like you said, who knows if we'll ever get to uh, sample those here in the States, but it was really, really uh, a great short smoke. Thanks, Trump. Thanks, Trump. Uh, thanks, Melania. Uh, the Wonderlust, my first, was groundbreaking from a Romacraft standpoint. Uh, mellow, smooth, creamy, just a uh, completely different profile than I've had from any of your other stuff. I loved it. Uh, second up, or third up, the 2019, I'm still smoking. Um, started out ball strong, really mellowed out in the middle. Uh, but honestly, I'm still thinking about the Wonderlust. So, so damn good. You're saying the Weaselito you can get is basically the Nobody can second get. half of the HC, the custom order? So it's the three Lanceros, the Neanderthal OM or the Cro-Magnar Aquitaine uh, Atlatl. It comes in 100 count boxes. Um, the left half is the bottoms and the right half is the tops. How much would a box of that cost in the States? Uh, somewhere around 300. But they're about... Two seventy-five to three twenty-five a piece for fifty. No, for a hundred. So 100. in the states that are living under Trump's authoritarian cigar laws, you can get the Weasley basically. You cannot get the, them. You can't yeah, get these anywhere. If you buy the if you buy the Lancero and you cut it in half, you have a Weaselito. And Basically. I would highly suggest doing that. <laughs> I don't want to suggest cutting it in half. Smoke that first half and uh, then smoke the second half. Boy, it was good. But, man, that Wonderlust really just, I'm still thinking about it. Uh, and the 2019, uh, I have not smoked the 2018 craft with the Candela. But um, are, are you asking for one? Weasel. I'm going to be here for a while. I, I, I know you we have a Fiorella. You get me drunk. I think we have a Fiorella for you. What? I think so. Now you're teasing no. me. Because you always... Oh, we're out of them? No, we have. Yeah, I think we have a couple for you. Every time I hear I ask and eat, I never get it. So, here's what I'll say. I think the fact that I'm ending the podcast on two... Yeah. I I think I deserve a little... You've earned it. I think so. So, we'll we'll pour us a a Goliath to close out the night or or a a tweak or something. That's all you got? But um, thanks for coming out to our office. It's been great to have you guys here. A year after, so when you guys first came here, it was probably about twenty-five percent of the done, percent of the way done. If that, yeah. Now it's about ninety-five percent. We're about to expand and have double the space. Oh wow! Um, we're gonna have everything from kind of like a spa shower to a locker room to a twenty-four hour lounge. Um, uh, not a sauna, but Can like I come get a steam. <laughs> I like well, my steams. Danny's been working on his uh, shiatsu technique. Um, <laughs> My we're gonna have we're gonna have craft robes. Um, it's gonna it's gonna be nice. But craft robes. <laughs> so I have to move to Austin as well. Yeah. So um, it's I been good. It's good to have you guys kind of come see us through our transition. Oh no, this is a great place and, to come back. And since you guys went straight into the podcast, we'll we'll kind of show you around the warehouse and the, and the other things. Uh, you we we look forward to it. You guys will see it on the website. We're gonna take pictures of everything and. Uh, Boy, uh, this is this is what you want in a place to work and a place to, to come. Thank you guys for always kind of opening your doors for us. Uh, I will say this. Anytime, at least the impression I get, anytime Skip uh, wants to get something off his chest, he knows he can turn to us <laughs> and we will turn on our microphones. And that invitation is always open. 
So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, you know, uh, only on the last day of Apple's VR, though. I think you're contractually obligated. We're only the... allowed to talk to you on the last day, and only for ten minutes. But so. you are allowed to come to our hospitality party. Yes, we at, can at night. Yes, we can. Which is way more live than anything Drew Estate's doing at night. Believe me. We will do a compare and contrast video of, <laughs> of both after parties. Uh, we do it every night. Danny, will this be your first? Oh, I thought you were shaking my hand. I am. So will, will this be your first IPCPR with Roma coming with Roma, up? Roma, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we'll our see booth you there. is our booth. By the way, is double size. Craft as fuck. Uh, all right, we'll see you there, and we're gonna have a good time. And we will. We are. Uh, the, the chains are unleashed. We can go to after parties, uh, but uh, this was fun. And 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 please, uh, you know what? I think the first hour of the show is where traditionally we get the juice we get you know whatever's on your mind whatever's going on in social media we get it out there and then we kind of rein it in to do the, the our beer and cigar movie thing so it's always fun so <laughs> thanks for having us brother yeah absolutely uh tut links uh hit us on twitter at tncc cast hit us on instagram tncc underscore podcast you can join us on the facebook page tuesday night cigar club you can also join us on uh subscribe to us on youtube uh, by the way, if you're listening and you want to shop on Amazon, then go to our website, click on the Amazon link, then do your shopping there. It helps us pay the bills. Famous. And uh, go to the Famous Smoke Shop banner. Do that. Oh, by the way, if you like the stinky ashtrays, go to uh, the website, click on the uh, Drew Estate banner, and enter a free giveaway for the ashtray. Do you have a YouPorn uh, link? I, I uh, go to Tuttle at <laughs> night for you porn. That's Tuttle, you. Tuttle after dark. Uh, youporn.com slash Marty Coleslaw. That's my uh, that's my thing. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll Absolutely. do it again soon. Absolutely. May the wings of Liberty Boys never lose a feather. Sayonara, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>